Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the June, what's the date? June 23rd Metro Board meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order and um, ask Curtis to do the safety announcement, please. Good morning, everyone. Curtis Moses, Safety Security and Risk Management Director. In the event there is an emergency, we have two means of egress for this building. To my right, we will go out this door, down the stairs, and we'll meet in the parking lot. If this entrance is blocked, we have a second means of egress out through the door to your left or my left. You'll go out down the hall and we'll meet in the rear parking lot where Donna and I will take head count of everybody that's here today. In the event of a medical emergency, uh, I will take the lead on uh, any situation. And I am uh, first aid certified. And that concludes my safety contact today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move to item three, which is roll call. And I'm going to um, pass it to Julie Sherman to give us an explanation of how we're going to do it today. Thanks, everyone, and happy Friday. So this is the first time that this agency is going to take advantage of the new Brown Act teleconference rules that were enacted under AB 2449, which allows board members to participate in either a just cause or emergency circumstance. You have two members today who are going to join under the emergency circumstance exception. And so once the roll is called for those members who are present, the, the um, law requires that both board members make a short announcement that they're joining for the emergency circumstance exception and request that the board approve their attendance via that exception. So the board would need to vote to do it together for both members to approve their attendance. And then both members, assuming the board votes yes, will be counted as present and able to vote and be part of the forum. Okay, so Donna. Yeah. Do you lose the uh, yeah. that explanation, Julie, sir. Moment. And while we're waiting, just so you know, if you qualify under the just cause exception, you do not have to ask for approval. And don't ask me why, <laughs> because it makes no sense. <laughs> I don't know why an emergency wouldn't be a just cause, but okay. So we're required that they join both visually oh, okay. and on the okay. after this law. All right. All right. And nothing to do with drafting this. <laughs> Sometimes I do have something, but I have no part of this. <laughs> it would have made more sense if you had, I'm sure. I <laughs> hope so. Although, you know, we are working on some legislation for Metro. And even though we start out in a good place, boy, when we go on a little bit in Sacramento, I don't know what they wind up doing with it. That's a lot of sense. There they are. Okay. All right. All right. We've got them back. <laughs> Okay. All right, sorry for the delay. All right, so a roll call uh, would be Director Brown. Present. Director Downey. Present. Director Dutra. Here. Director Collentary Johnson. Present. Director Koenig. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director Newsom. Present. Director Here. Director Pierce Hebert Carter. Here. Ex officio Director Henderson. Here. And ex officio director and uh, director McPherson. Um, okay, at this point, I'm, I just want to announce I'm attending pursuant to the emergency exception due to a medical issue and am requesting the board to approve my attendance uh, via teleconference. Okay. 
and Director Rapkin. Yes, I'm here and I'm attending pursuant to the emergency exception due to a medical issue and requesting the board approve my attendance via teleconference. Director Brown. Hi. Director Downey. Hi. Director Dutra. Hi. Director Palantari Johnson. Hi. Director Koenig. Hi. Director Lynn. Hi. Director Newsom. Hi. Director Pegler. Hi. Director T. Rose Carter. Hi. So Kiskia, Director Henderson. Oh, I'm sorry. It's like my surprise for two seconds. <laughs> We do have uh, one. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We get more, but I just saw this and I didn't walk away. You get a certain amount a year or? Yes. 20% for emergency circumstance, okay. which is approximately two meetings. Two? Yeah, okay. four board, and then you can have two per committee as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for um, walking us through that. I'm glad you are able to join us. Um, virtually, Director McPherson and Rockin. Okay. Cool. One more question. Yeah. So, if you do it from like a from a public place, does that count? So, like, if you it did does it, count, but you might as well just do, do the standard teleconference rules if you know three days in advance. Okay, so that doesn't count then towards your correct. So, if you have two things now, you can do traditional rules. Okay. Or you can do this AB two four four nine. Okay. So I'm like, okay, if I do it once in City Hall, I know three days before, that's not going to count towards my two. Correct. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. 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 But we want you here in the yeah. Don't join us today. All right. Let's move on to item four, which is announcements. So today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And Language Line Service is providing Spanish interpretation services, which will be available during oral communications and for any other agenda item for which these services are needed. And we do have um, interpretation services here. Good morning, my name is Maria. I'm from Language Line Solutions um, Services and um, Spanish Speaking um, Translation. Mi nombre es Maria, estoy aquí para los servicios de intérprete en español. For being here, Ms. Oh. All right, item five, board of director comments. Okay, item six. Mike is raising his Oh, I'm sorry. Forgot to look up at the virtual screen. Please, Director Rodkin. This is the time for a comment from a board member? Yes, that's correct. Yes, I, I just like to make a comment that um, in the packet of materials that we get, the budget comes to us and it comes with the, the uh, slides in the presentation sideways which is fine if you're printing the budget out because you can then you can look at it and just turn it around but it's really difficult when it's on your screen because you, you have to turn the you know laptop around or if you have a desktop i don't know what you do you can turn the thing around to look at it so i would hope that the next year's budget that there's a technical way to actually present these slides uh, up straight up and down rather than on their sides that's that's the total comment thank you Thank you, Director Rodkin. You can click on the header and reverse the slides on your computer when you can view them. There is that, there is a, a how Donna explained, but there is a way to do that, Mike, now. <laughs> and when Sean presents, he will, it will be. Thanks, I'll learn how to do that then. Thank you. I can do that offline. Too. I can show you. Okay. Yeah, if we post it in the first grade. I'm going to see them today uh, presented by the um, yes by the staff, so it won't be an issue. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you. Any other um, board of director comments? Okay. Moving on to oral and written communications. Any oral communications? Anyone here wish to speak? Anyone online, Donna? Okay, and I'll just note receipt of the um, letter from Santa Cruz County Commission on Disabilities via the Board of Supervisors was in our packet. Okay, labor organization communication. Good morning, Brendan Freeman, Senior Vice Chair. Uh, sorry that James couldn't join today. He's coming back from the home office in Cleveland, so he's currently on a plane. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about negotiations. I know it's the top of everyone's mind. Um, as I'm sure most of you guys know, we do have tentative agreements for both of our properties, both characters and fixed row. We will be voting those next Thursday. So we had to give all of our people 10 days notice so they can get all the information they need to review. So we'll have an answer for you then. Um, we do not have a board meeting in July. So if those things both go through, then we'll be reaching out to you to hopefully convene a special meeting to get those ratified. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the process of how we got to the tentative agreements this time as compared to how it was last time. Um, obviously, this time it was very quiet, right? We, we didn't have to drop any service. We didn't have to go to the media. We didn't have to be taking interviews. We didn't have to be doing any of these things. And that is hugely because of the way that we were treated internal. Under this current team with Don, with Michael, with the team that you guys put forward this time, we were treated with respect. We could disagree and not have it turn personal. Okay? We were able to handle issues that mattered to us, issues that had mattered to Metro. We were able to find the amount of money that is working for us and doesn't break the bank, because obviously, you know, that's a, always the big concern. Um, but I just really wanted to, you know, stress that this time I didn't have to spend two and a half weeks negotiating language, turning the general manager title into a CEO title. Um, there was a lot less of that personal kind of stuff that was happening this time around. And that's a direct reflection of the team that you guys brought this time. So I wanted to thank Metro's team for making it much easier. Don Tremay, Daniel Zaragoza, Chuck Farmer, the lawyer, Pat and Jamel, and then Michael, who decided to clear his schedule for almost two weeks and clear the tables and sit down with myself, with James, and with Pat, and just really get this done. So... The deal that you're going to be seeing in closed session is something that I think that we can live with, that I think will pass. Um, so I hope that you guys see it that way. Obviously, you're not going to take action until we do. I get it. Um, but but know that this was this was a lot better. And when I stood up here before with a petition asking for you to remove your previous CEO, this is exactly what I was hoping to get. This is exactly what we were hoping to be able to do when we go into this negotiation and be able to treat each other professionally not worry about personal issues that we have outside of the table and have this go smoothly. I think that's extremely important, not just to us, but also for our public and for our community who was not affected by having their bus not come, who didn't have to deal with a lot of the different things that we had to go through last time because we had to break down those personal issues and barriers. So, you know, hopefully this will pass on both sides that are coming through, but even if not, I know that the team that is in place and the way that we work together, we will be able to find something that's going to work for us. I think it's very important that that is known and acknowledged that in only one year's time, we are in a completely different situation now than we were before. And I, will, I am surprised that I'm able to sit here and say, I just went through a negotiation. It wasn't hostile. So thank you. Thank you for those comments and thank you for your role and James's role and everyone else who worked on this. I know it's a lot of work. Thank you. Okay. Item eight, additional documentation to support existing agenda. Thank you. Moving on to consent. These are items 9.1 through 9.14. So let me see if there are any items that there are questions, comments, or need to be from board members. Okay. Uh -huh. I Oh, let me see if sure, you guys sure. can take public oh, comment, right? Uh -huh. See if there's any comment from um, the public on consent items, 9.1 through 9.14. Okay. I'd move adoption of the consent agenda. Thanks. Okay. Second. We have a bunch of seconds. <laughs> I think I heard Director Conan. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Director Brown? Aye. Director Downey? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colin Perry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pigler? Aye. <clears throat> Director P. Rose Carter? Aye. Director Rockman? Aye. And the motion passes. Okay. All right. Thank you. We are now on our regular agenda. Item 10 is presentation of employee longevity award. Jose Valpiera, yep. Oh, oh on, the, on the consent item? Was it on the consent item? 
it's a general item about uh, our routes and service. Uh, I apologize. I okay, you you were hoping to speak during our presentation. That's okay. We can go back to that. Please step up to the podium. That's okay. Hi, my name is Diana Oak, and uh, I'm here to discuss uh, a matter of great importance to me and several of the colleagues that I work with that have mental disorders. And uh, I myself have PTSD and bipolar issues, and there's a couple of others coming from Watsonville to Santa Cruz also that have bipolar issues as well. It's uh, taken a really big toll mentally on several of us uh, taking the 90, uh, 69A and W and the 71. And we're hoping that uh, maybe we could talk you all into please bringing back the 91X that uh, really, really, really need it badly. Um, I've uh, had a couple of breakdowns while I've been taking the bus to get to my job and back. And, uh, and we're just um, hoping that, you know, we urge you to please bring it back. It's a matter, of, and there's several of us coming from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, and unfortunately, they're not able to make it here today because we had to work. And uh, so I'm here all by myself, which doesn't really look good, but um, I'm not alone in speaking about this matter. Um, so if you could please consider um, bringing back the 91X, we really greatly appreciate it. Thank you for coming here and for your comments. Thank you. We are back at regular agenda item 10, and that is presentation of employee longevity awards. And I understand um, the two employees being recognized are not here today. Uh, that was good. They are here. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. okay. All right. Good job. <laughs> Like that. <laughs> That's so slack. Yeah. <laughs> no, you just started when I started. Happy New Year. Yes, absolutely. All right. This is Carly Patrick, Jose Vaquiera. Um, Jose Vaquiera for 10 years of service. Thank you so much all right. for Thank all you of guys. your work. Transit supervisor, would you like to say? I just want to thank the Metro for the opportunities. Uh, it makes the job easier when you have great leadership. Anna's been great. Daniel's been great. Mike's been great. Um, my coworkers, the public, we wouldn't be here without them. And uh, uh, operators out there grinding every day. So, thanks. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. With the chair. Yeah. Okay, and we have um, another longevity award for Seraphine Ruiz for 25 years as bus operator. I think Seraphine is not here today, correct? Okay. Well, we can do a round of applause. Yes. For Okay. Item 11 is retire, retiree resolution of appreciation for Efren Hernandez. Is Mr. Hernandez here? Okay. Well, thank you, Efren, for all of your years of service here at the Metro. Round of applause for Efren. Uh, a document approving the appreciation uh, for his service. A second big resolution. Great. 
Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Collins? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pagler? Aye. Director Pierce Carter? Aye. Director Rockin? Aye. The motion passed. Thank you again for your service. All right, moving on to item 12, which is the Metro Advisory Committee semi annual oral update from Jessica DeWitt. Madam Chair, please welcome. Okay. Uh, good morning, board members. I'm Jessica DeWitt, the current MAC Chair. The MAC Committee is very appreciative of the opportunity to be with you here today to provide the six month MAC report. Uh, the, the members of the MAC committee represent a diverse range of ridership needs and interests. Over the last six months, MAC has been actively engaged on Metro information technology systems deployment of the Clever Devices system and the automated passenger counter system with discussion that's included on how to access the information it provides riders as well as their, whether there would be future opportunities to add real-time data on whether accessibility seats are available, um, as well as potentials for uh, any kind of bike rack available information. We really appreciate Director Isaac Holly being very patient with us with all of our questions and, um, and requests. Um, for the COVID-19 updates, Mac is very happy to hear from Director Curtis Moses that COVID cases have seen a major decrease with only one positive case in the last 60 days as of the last MAC meeting in April. Also, at that April MAC meeting, MAC members received a very informative budget presentation from Finance Deputy Director Christina Mejadopa, right? Um, and she re responded with all of MAC's questions in a very easy to understand way for a super complicated topic. Finally, Director John Ergo's reporting is a continually increasing ridership is welcome news for the MAC, as that also means service is increasing, um, like the newly added service to and from San Jose State University. MAC also greatly appreciates that um, Director Ergo is working with our very own uh, Veronica on a special rail bus stop project. Uh, Metro has a lot of exciting projects and programs in the works, and we're very much excited to be a part of them moving forward. Thank you. So much. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you for that update. <clears throat> There's no action on that. Um, all right. So we are on item 13. We're opening up the public hearing for the final adoption of the Santa Cruz Metro's FY24 and FY25 budget. Mr. Farmer. Hello, everybody. Back again. <laughs> um, I, I wish I could say this the last time I'm going to talk about the budget, but uh, here I'm Coming in to kind of go over the budget, the official budget to uh, get it approved and move forward. Um, I'll have clipper. <clears throat> and we'll come back in August once we kind of settle on the UV contracts and update the budget at that point. But right now, uh, going through, we're going to look to uh, approve the budget, operating budget. I'm not going to go through each slide. Um, started in March, and we talked again in April, talked again in May, and then May we presented the budget, and then now we're doing it again in June after we opened up the uh, period of review public hearing. And as part of it, uh, I'll kind of explain what we've changed since the last board month of May, instead of going through the full budget in uh, uh, big details. So. From 23, I think we built a responsible budget from bottoms up based off of what we see going forward. Um, from that aspect of it, you know, uh, bottom line, when I look at the bottom line, it's not very zero, but it's actually what's its operating surplus before transfers. We're slightly down about $1.3 million, but that's to be expected because we've had a lot of inflationary push, especially on fuel pricing that's been going up. It's not really coming down, CNG wise, and so on and so on. And like I said, uh, you know, there's a lot of costs associated. This does not include any type of cost of living adjustments on people's uh, pay, 
I said that will come probably in August, cross our fingers, or maybe update the budget at that point. On to the next slide. So here's what's changed. So in May, we went to the board, we had an operating surplus uh, for transfers of about 7.5 million. We made a couple tweaks in here. Uh, we went back and we reviewed some of the open positions and did some salary adjustments based off of uh, stuff we got back. That's about $30,000. And then we added in uh, California Hydrogen uh, Business Council membership, which is another 8,000 now that we're going to train trust. Uh, so that's about 37,000. And then slightly offset is that we had, we trued up all the federal and state grants, uh, puts and takes and so forth. And that ended up being about a $30,000 gain. So net net it's $8,000 uh, worse off. Uh, so now we're at uh, 75 or seven seven point five million dollars. Oh, I just flipped two. I wanted to show you this, but nothing changed. So since April till now, all the different positions that we put in uh, has not changed. We've not added positions, changed positions. We did some updates on the positions on salary pricing, as you noticed, but not the actual positions themselves. So FY 24 to 25, continuing with some of those salary adjustments um, moving forward, as well as some updates in the grants. Uh, for the most part, like I said, this, this Total, total and changes that we have right now, um, year over year, uh, basically changed, I can tell you, uh, $45,000 from the last time we presented. So um, right now our FY 24 to 25, you know, we had the increase basically in some ridership and contractual increases. So that's about the 232. Even though we don't have the cost of living adjustments, every year on people's anniversaries, they potentially have a step adjustment. Um, and then, of course, we have our benefits, which, you know, they seem to go up 8% a year. It's just naturally, it's an uh, increase. So that's driving about $1.4 million. And then there's some puts and takes about $80 million. So down below, we, um, we actually, in 25 run out of our COVID release grants. So we've now pulled out all the money that's been given to Metro. And now we're going back and using our like 5307 to subsidize that difference. So that's why you're kind of seeing the 9.9 .9 drop in COVID offset by the federal state. That, that we're about $4.1 million lower year over year um, in, in the changes. So we're at now about $3.4 million. Here's a uh, income statement side by side. As you can see, you see the different pieces kind of walk through the bottom line number and some of the different changes that we've made. And then on the capital side, um, I'm only going to highlight the two. The only thing that changed from our April board meeting were the first two months. We had initially had 27 hydrogen buses. We now have 29 hydrogen buses. Um, that will probably be updated again. Um, come August, but at this point right now, we added two more hydrogen buses, so that's why it's highlighted. And then we have our 10 CNG Arctic buses now officially coming in from San Diego, and that cost is to basically give them up the speed, wrap them, paint them in our colors, change the seats out, and so forth. So um, it's probably over, the number's probably too high, but it's, at least we're safe right now. And until we get them on the lot and do everything, we're not quite sure. So. That's the, that's the only change that, that's happened in the capital. So right now we're about $83 million in total spend, uh, 21 of which is gonna take place just in FY24. And then uh, from this slide right here on the funding sources, we did have one slight change. We've um, moved around and added in the USDOT uh, 2022 Multimodal Projects Discretionary Grant. We do not have that in April. That's that little blue one up in the top uh, right-hand corner. It's about $4.8 million. And from there, we were able to kind of reallocate some of the cost to be lower within our operating capital reserve as well as our transfer um, major GDP. Of course, it still stays the same, 37.1. 
And that may even change again, because we're still talking about some other issues too, but ultimately this is where we stand today for the budget. And then on the five-year plan, this is the one thing I wanna kind of point out on the five-year plan. When you look at this, I know it's kind of more of a trend and it's more about kind of where we're projecting. But when we start looking at out of this here, as you notice on the operating surplus and deficit for transfers, by 2028, it'll go negative. That means any money that we spend on capital that comes out of our money, we don't have money to pay for it. In fact, we're actually taking money out of our bank account in order to pay that $364,000. And then of course, if there's any capital that comes out of our money, that's just coming out of our bank account. Second thing is what I wanna take a look at here. If you look at under the transfer line, down the very last line, it says transfers to and from COVID recovery fund. So this is money that we've put in our COVID recovery fund, and then it's money that comes out. And in this case, it's money coming out to help subsidize our bottom line. And as you notice, it keeps getting bigger and bigger every year. We're running out of money. And then pretty much in 2028, 2029, we're out of money on COVID. So we said there'll be more down the road and start talking a little bit more in details about the projections going forward. But um, I just kind of want to highlight those two. One, we go negative on our operating PL. Mm -hmm. Then two, we're subsidizing a lot of that bottom line in that COVID recovery. Can I ask a question here? Sure. Chuck, um, th this is before we take out the, the changes that are due, as you said, to the step increases and salary increases. I'm assuming that when that happens, that we're, we're run out of money sooner than 28. Something I don't know that you know what it is, but 26 or something else earlier. Is that is that the case? Yeah, 27. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we'll see that in August where, where we really are at. Yeah. Thank you. I'll have to get into the weeds, but can you give me a quick rundown of what constitutes passenger fares and what constitutes special transit fares? Yeah. So so passenger fares are like our Highway 17, fixed route, and so forth. And then our special transit fares are, um, in your case, UCSC, the Rio College. Okay, that's that's what I thought. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Thank you. And then, um, now here we are. We're at the very bottom right. We're at the end of this cycle of the budget at this point in June, and now we're ready to vote. Within the budget. Thank you for the presentation, Chuck. Um, I'll see if directors have questions. Director. Uh, back to the last slide. So <laughs> we've seen these numbers so many times, it's amazing to put myself questions on it. But <laughs> um, so going from budget uh, year 23 to 24, passenger fares is only basically at about 26.4% increase from 2.4 million to 3 million. Mm -hmm. Um, can you remind me what the subtrends of drivers are in that? I mean, is that certain because it's based on some of our core contracts at the university and your college, or is it a projection based on? The so, so the special transit fares is contractual. So that's really primarily what's driving the piece. But the passenger fares is the uh, evaluation that now we have buses and drivers and seats and driving around. And as COVID recovers, we are seeing more and more people coming into specifically like Highway 17, um, getting into things as well as paratransit. I mean, they're already in the past. So I mean, Daniel will tell you he's really picking up more people. And so you're seeing in 23, there's all the way back in um, the summer of 22, when we're still kind of coming out of that second round. And now it's building up. And then now we're leaping forward to 23 at a good level, and then moving that forward to 24. Okay, so it's based on the steadily increasing returning ridership. Yeah, it, yeah, that's it. Um, and then with the expenses, and I'm trying to get into that fiscal cliff in 2028, the, uh, it's amazing how much the non personnel expenses increase, right? From 12 million. Fiscal year 23 to 21 million in fiscal year 28. Um, is that 
insurance, fuel. Some of it's insurance, mainly fuel. I mean, fuel is, fuel's a big dollar amount on there too. It was one other thing. You know what that, what was the other one that's on a blank on it? So we have a lot of we have one time expenditures that programs that we are launching that we will go away in next year. Big chunk of that is insurance. Insurance is very expensive. And unfortunately, it's really challenging for us to even find insurance payers because they're exiting the market. But that translates into 30 and more percentage increase in insurance. And that is not on property, not on cyber, but it's also um, liability for our vehicles, LP. So that, that's an ongoing increase. One other thing, too, is our um, inventory, which we expense as we buy, not capitalize or go on to the bus. Uh, all the parts and everything have gone dramatically up in price, <clears> and they're almost 30 to 40% up in cost. Tires to fuel pumps, you name it. That was the other piece, too. And right now, we don't have kind of visibility to say, hey, in the future, it's going to come down. So we're not going to do it down unless we know. Obviously, it's not decreasing. They're not certain. I can kind of make assumptions based on what we've seen so far. I mean, is that the worst case scenario? Is it the middle of the road scenario? Middle of the road. Because, like I said, we I just don't know. I mean, at the same point, you know, like fuel, they're expecting hydrogen to come down. I think it's like a dollar, all the way down to like a dollar uh, per gallon equivalent by the time we hit 2030. But right now, they don't have a pathway to get there. And it's traded right now, it's somewhere around $13 or $14 a gallon equivalent. So they have a long way to go and they got to get there quick. So, like, so what are we assuming that in this figure 28? So, right now, on this on average, it's right around about nine. Let's call the hydrogen plant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about it already. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Okay, Director McPherson. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I I really want to thank Mr. Farmer and uh, uh, Mr. Tree for um, getting this uh, a survivable budget. I guess you'd say under the circumstances. Um, I'm reading about state and federal agencies that are just really. Uh, uh, at the end of the rope, and they don't know how they're going to survive. So, uh, thank you for doing this and your work with the labor organizations and uh, understanding what we're up against. Uh, a lot of uncertainties and the variables with COVID. Um, what you've, we, we, what you presented is is somewhat of a relief to me uh, that we we're in good shape at least until 2027. It looks like, or, um, and I just wanted to mention too. I, I participated in a. Uh, Central Coast Community Energy uh, meeting on Wednesday and uh, electric buses uh, request for them uh, through that agency is uh, there's a lot of them for this agency that's 35 governing agencies down to Santa Barbara County, uh, but uh, we can be in the mix and there's going to be some requests from us I know, as well as electric bikes, uh, which uh, are very popular in this county so um, there's there's a limited amount of resources but. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, the cooperative effort that we have been able to have with Triple CE. Uh, I think it's going to work out, and there's going to be some real benefits. But uh, thank you for this this budget presentation. Under the circumstances, I think um, we're doing a lot better than a lot of other transit agencies throughout California. Thank you. Thank you, Director McPherson. Others? Okay, I'll take it out to the public for public comment. All right, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to our board for a motion. Move approval of the budget recommended by staff. Okay, Director Second. Rodman. Director Conan. Director Brown. Aye. Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Perry Johnson. Aye. Aye. Director Conan. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Nielsen. Aye. Director Tabler. Aye. Director Kiros Carter. Aye. 
question, Director Rapkin. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Farmer, and thank you to the team for all your great work. All right, we are on agenda item 14, Reimagine Metro Project Oral Update. Mr. John Ergo. Sir, good morning, directors. While we get uh, Daniel Constantino queued up from Jarrett Walker and Associates, so I'll give a brief introduction to this item. So we last came to you in March when we were in the middle of our first round of outreach uh, on this process. Since then, we've held uh, dozens of stakeholder and public meetings to kind of get a general sense of what the public and current riders are looking for in our system. Um, we held a design retreat in April, uh, with labor, with staff in cities and counties, cities in the county, um, to design a short-term uh, network for implementation in December. So that's what we're bringing to you uh, today. Um, and then, after this meeting, we're going to begin the outreach. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in July and August. On the short-term plan, we'll come back in August uh, for approval for implementation in December. And again, the idea behind the short-term plan is to kind of get the house in order um, and uh, incorporate everything we've heard in these first round and what we'll hear in the second round of outreach, uh, so that we can then build upon it in the long-range plan, which we'll also come back to in the fall. Another the third round of outreach and for approval in the end of the year in December. Um, so I'll turn it over to Daniel and I'll look here to answer any questions about it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, you can. Okay. I am going to share screen. Um, is my presentation visible to you all as a full screen? Yes. Great. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I last came to you all in person back in March in Scotts Valley. Um, and I'm here today to basically tell you where we're at now and where we're going. And um, largely to let you know that we're gonna need some direction from you in August after this next public outreach process. So um, you should expect to hear from your constituents soon and hopefully think about the issues at hand and so that we are able to move forward with some changes uh, in December. But let me get through the whole thing. So uh, just a quick reminder about Reimagine Metro. So Reimagine Metro is a process where uh, we are re-envisioning where and how often buses should run in Santa Cruz County. Um, with the goals being to uh, increase the amount of service provided, make transit more reliable and relevant to the community's needs, adapt to today's travel patterns, and really the overarching goal of creating a network that is useful and attractive for many more people's trips than it is today. So we are working in two time horizons. There is what we're calling the short term, which is really the end of this year. We're trying to see what improvements can be made by the end of this year with current resources. Um, and that's most of what I'll be talking about today. And then we are working in the long term, next year and beyond, uh, what improvements should we be planning for uh, to create what um, I think we are all hoping will eventually be a world-class transit system. So um, we are working on this. We have Santa Cruz Metro staff uh, planning uh, on the front lines, but we've also worked with staff from operations, uh, operators, and marketing staff. Uh, assisted by the consultant team led by the firm I work for, Jarrett Walker & Associates. I'm the project manager on our end. We also have assistance from AMA Transit Planning, a uh, Monterey-based uh, paratransit and public outreach firm. So they're helping us with public outreach. And we've had the opportunity through this process to collaborate with um, a large number of local agencies and jurisdictions, uh, including the cities, uh, including the Regional Transportation Commissioning, Commission, including UCSC and others. So um, back in March, I came to you and spoke to you about sort of a lot of the data analysis we had done to date to learn more about your community and how your bus network is functioning. At that time, we were also in the middle of a public outreach effort. And that outreach was really uh, designed to hear prior to you know, us developing too many ideas about what's going on, what the concerns of the public are, um, there had been a poll conducted in fall 2022 that helped us understand a lot of concerns from the general public. 
And then from about February to April, we held a bunch of different meetings with riders, with stakeholders, um, online and in person, and an online public meeting as well. Um, and in April, we also held a network design workshop where we looked at what we could be doing in terms of drawing lines on maps. And that involved um, staff from planning, staff from operations, um, drivers, uh, and all the jurisdictions that I mentioned previously. So in the course of our public outreach, there's really a few kind of overarching messages we've heard. We heard a lot of different things, but in terms of messages that um, it feels like we can act on in the course of this process, um, the most important things are probably that really with the current service right now, it takes people too long to get to the places they need to go. And that there's a lot of different factors that play into that, but one of the big ones are, you know, buses are infrequent and so there are long waits. Um, on some lines and for some kinds of trips, uh, rides feel like they are far slower than they should be. And in some cases, in it's perhaps more prominent in some parts of the network and at some times of day where there's peak demand, but there are occasional missed trips. And there's a lot, a lot of people have feelings about that, regardless of you know what the actual objective percentage of those trips is. So there's that. Too long to get places. And then there's a real feeling that there isn't enough service. In fact, in the fall 2022 poll, we asked people what was extremely, very, somewhat important to them. And people have all people think all sorts of things are extremely or very important. But people think that regardless, without even talking about any purpose for the service, 70% of respondents from a statistically significant sample are telling you that Metro, it's very or extremely important for Metro to provide more service. And I think that that's really borne out by the reality on the ground as well. We know Metro is still, despite restoring some service, providing less service than you did in 2019 and significantly less service than you did 20 years ago. So in addition to that, we heard a broad range of other concerns, um, communications, fare structure, reliability, weekend and evening service levels, bike bus connections, um, various UCSC specifics and others. Um, I won't go into them in detail at the moment, but just to let you know, we have kind of a broad range of things that we've heard and that we're trying to act on. A couple important data points from that um, fall 2022 poll that I also want to give you to establish some context. We asked people specifically questions about uh, frequency, the importance of frequency uh, in places where lots of people travel versus coverage to as many places as possible. And broadly speaking, people in the county think you should be focusing probably more on frequency in those places. Um, I wouldn't take this as an absolute, but it is a good indicator that people are not asking you to extend service down every canyon. They want service that is useful in the places where it can be useful. Um, broadly speaking, that's not to say that's what everyone thinks. The other important thing that we heard in that poll, uh, or one of the other important things, is that um, in thinking about uh, whether there are any communities whose needs should be prioritized, there seems to be a relatively broad consensus that Metro should be focusing on the needs of communities where there are many people who have low incomes or many people who don't have reliable access to a personal vehicle, and that that's more important than trying to provide kind of a, an equal amount of service per population, regardless of income or personal vehicle access. So that's what we heard. In this first stage, um, if you can see my mouse, what we did in this first stage is these first two boxes, this orange and blue box here, analyzing the network, phase one of community input. Today, we are at the stage where in the next week, at most two, we are releasing the alternatives report, which I'll present a summary to you of after uh, this introduction. That alternatives report is going to form the basis for the next phase of public outreach that's going to start in early July and go through early mid August. And in that phase, we're going to want to know what people think about these alternatives for the short term and about priorities for the future. And we're going to report back to you, the board, at your meeting at the end of August and say, here's what we heard. Here is what we think this means. Uh, is this the correct direction? Are there any adjustments we should make? And based on that direction, uh, we will then go ahead as a project team and finalize where we want to go for the end of 2023, leading to a service change in December. And based on this finalized alternative, 
work on designing the future service improvements um, in which we'll incorporate priorities for the future. So uh, this is kind of a, a, the, the word version of the graphic I just showed you. We'll go to outreach in July, August. Uh, at the end of August, we'll ask for direction. And in the fall, we'll work on a draft future network plan. In December, implement short-term service changes. And in early 2024, we'll finalize the future network plan. Um, I apologize. I need to plug my computer into a, a charger. I will be right back to complete this. Mm -hmm. So as for the alternatives for change in 2023, so this is a plan for the very short term. And we are working on a plan for the very short term because we have heard pretty loud and clear that there are a number of issues and frustrations that feel urgent to the public to address. And we would like to address as many of these as quickly as possible. And in terms of making a major service change, um, you know, three to six months is really the shortest that one can do it after a decision. And so we would, um, so basically we're trying to target December. So in that time, what we think can be achieved in any case is an increase in service, about 10% increase in service overall. That's based on the uh, recruiting efforts that are going on right now for operators. Um, we uh, can achieve higher frequency by reorganizing service in areas with higher demand. We can get to simpler and more direct routes from A to B, and that is countywide, but I think it's probably the biggest changes are uh, in terms of making routes simpler are in Watsonville. Um, and we can work on improving transfers, which we know are an issue right now. We know there are very long waits at transfers, and we know that a lot of people have to pay a second fare to transfer, and that's a big issue. Um, we are... Within this plan, we are assuming that it will be possible to achieve free transfers. That is something that you all, the board, will need to explicitly approve, so I just want to flag that for you. But we have two alternatives. Both of them include all of these items. Now I'll show you kind of what's actually in these alternatives in terms of lines on a map. So to start, uh, to establish some context, here is a map of existing Metro service in your core areas from between Santa Cruz and Watsonville. Um, on this map, um, you'll see that there are lines and those lines have colors. Colors reflect frequency. Um, dark blue lines come about every 30 minutes on weekdays. Light blue or teal lines come about once an hour. And other lines that are gold and kind of fading in in the background come less than once an hour. So what this tells you is that, um, well, you are providing service to almost every place where you could reasonably operate service right now um, in Santa Cruz County, or at least in this core area. Um, but none of that service is very frequent. So there are some there are long waits. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scale of change that's going to be contemplated, I'm going to flip you to alternative A, which is the slightly more radical one. Uh, and then I'm going to flip back and forth a couple of times so you can see. So here is what we're calling alternative A, where we are leaning the most towards increased frequency. So this is a map of the same area. And you'll notice that there are a couple new colors in this map. Uh, red lines are areas where buses come every 15 minutes on weekdays in the daytime. And uh, purple areas are where they come uh, every... 15 to 20 minutes um, on weekdays in the daytime. And so big thing to notice here is fewer light blue lines, fewer hourly lines, more service that is uh, either every 30 minutes or better or every 15 minutes or better. So I'm gonna flip back and forth a couple times just so you can see that existing, alternative A, existing, Alternative A, existing, and alternative A again. Um, so I'm going to focus for a minute on alternative A, um, just so you understand the big picture of what is being contemplated. Um, and I'll kind of go from uh, west to east. 
A um, couple things to note. Um, so you'll notice that on the west side of Santa Cruz, routes 18 and 19 are both doubled in frequency. They both go to every 15 minutes. And in alternative A, that's made possible because uh, we would no longer provide service on High Street. Um, and so there would, and so that that service would be reallocated uh, back into service on the 18 and 19, in addition to the 10% added service. That makes it possible to double service um, on your two highest ridership, most productive routes, and to provide service that is uh, truly every 15 minutes in both direction within UCSC and on all your most populated areas on the west side. Consequence being that there wouldn't be service on High Street. Um, then uh, you'll notice that we have uh, made Route 35 going up to the San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, all, route, all buses on that, 35s and 35Es, would now go straight up to Scotts Valley um, via Highway 17. Emmeline and social services would be put back on Route 4 where they used to be. Um, goal being to uh, keep the same level of service at Emmeline right now once an hour while increasing the directness of trips up to Scotts Valley in the San Lorenzo Valley. In the Live Oak, uh, where you, curr you currently have two routes, routes 66 and 68, you can see them here. Uh, they do different things going through Twin Lake, Pleasure Point, Romer Road, and 7th. In alternative A, those are consolidated into one route, which we are calling Route 3, that would run every 30 minutes. So by consolidating them, we're able to make it run more frequently, uh, but we, we are requiring a few people to walk farther. Um, then um, you'll notice a significant change in what is today the 69 and 71. And so we have these placeholder route names for now. We're calling them the 1 and the 2. Um, and so instead of having the various 69s and the various 71s, you have the one and the two, they all operate coming out of Santa Cruz on Water Avenue so that you have service every 15 minutes on Water Avenue out to Capitola Road, at which point some of them go, to, go via Capitola Road and others via Sakel Drive, like the 69 and 71 today. They come back together at 41st as today, but because their schedule is coordinated, they come back in uh, almost still coordinated every 10 to 20 minutes on Soquel Drive past Cabrillo College, where there'd now be a bus every 10 to 20 minutes instead of two buses every half hour. And then they go towards Watsonville. And the really big change here is that um, one of these would still serve Aptos Village, but both of them eventually get onto Highway 1. And so while these are both local service lines, they are both taking the fastest possible path to and from Watsonville or between Aptos and Watsonville. There would still be service on Freedom Boulevard, um, but because Freedom Boulevard is a relatively low population and low demand area, that service would go from every 30 minutes to every 60 minutes. And in alternative A, that would really be service between Watsonville and Aptos and Cabrillo College this Route 73 that's here. So pretty significant changes to what's happening between Santa Cruz and Watsonville. And then in Watsonville itself, so Watsonville right now has a very complicated pattern of service where there are three or four buses on every main street, but none of them come very often. They all go different places and many of them go different places depending on which direction you're riding. So in Watsonville, we've tried to get as many of these routes as possible operating every 30 minutes instead of every 60 minutes. So again, doubling frequencies on most of these streets. Um, we have both the two main corridors, Main Street and Freedom Boulevard with service every 30 minutes to Santa Cruz via Highway 1. Um, we've consolidated services on Green Valley Road so that there's really a bus every 30 minutes into and out of town. Um, and we've added service out to uh, the industrial areas on um, West Beach, uh, out to neighborhoods in, on Ohlone Parkway, the new county health facilities, and basically covering a lot of the, some, a lot of the areas that Circulator does now, or a lot of the things that the Circulator does now, getting to um, destinations that are important for certain populations, even if they're not necessarily um, high ridership generation destinations in themselves. 
So, um, and another thing to note in Watsonville that's important and that's true in both alternatives is that the lines would be scheduled for timed transfers. So in Santa Cruz, transfers would become faster because most buses would be more frequent. In Watsonville, transfers would be faster partly because of frequency, but mostly because buses would be aligned so that they all arrive at more or less the same time and leave together five to 10 minutes later. So that's alternative A versus existing. Alternative B is a little bit different from alternative A, but the, the big picture is pretty similar. But here's A, B, A, B, A, and B again. So in alternative B, what we've tried to do is maintain as many as possible of the sort of frequency and travel time um, improvements in alternative A while um, softening the blow a little bit on coverage, maintaining service close to uh, more of the places where it's available right now. So what that amounts to is uh, about maybe three, four key differences. On the west side, um, only Route 18 would be upgraded to every 15 minutes. Service would be maintained on High Street, um, but that would mean that the High Street and Bay Street services, 10 and 19, would both be every 30 minutes. So you'd still have service every 15 minutes on campus. You wouldn't have frequent service on Bay Street into the boardwalk. You would maintain service on High Street. Um, in the Southern Live Oak, uh, instead of having one route with service every 30 minutes that's sort of merged and requires a, a certain number of people to walk farther, we would largely maintain the current split between the 66 and the 68 by creating these A and B patterns, one of which goes through Twin Lakes, the other through 7th and Bromer, and then continuing to cover both of 38th and 41st. But that also means by the same token, those shorter walks mean longer waits. Um, in terms of Santa Cruz to Watsonville, um, there's two key differences. One is that the rural parts of Freedom Boulevard would remain on the long regional route here. Uh, it's not called 71, it's called 2A, but it is largely similar in routing to the existing 71 um, in that it goes from Watsonville Transit Center through Rural Freedom and then to Santa Cruz via Sakel Drive. Um, the, um, all, the other thing is that um, as a consequence of this, we are able to make it possible to bring back the 91X in the short term in alternative B. The 91X wouldn't be an all day service with the, uh, the way we've been able to figure out the budget so far. It would be a peak only service, but it would be a Watsonville to Santa Cruz Express that we would be available probably for about three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, nonstop. The consequences for that in Watsonville are that you would only have that every 30 minute service to Santa Cruz consistently on the Freedom and Airport Boulevards, you wouldn't have that service every 30 minutes on Main Street. Main Street would, would have hourly service to Santa Cruz, um, you know, except for whenever the 91X is running. So that's the main difference. Otherwise, Watsonville, similar idea to what's being proposed before, higher frequencies, straighter lines, um, and time transfers at Watsonville Transit Center. So that is a lot of information to absorb. I don't expect everyone to have heard all of it now, but this is what's being put on the table. Um, and um, when the report comes out, I encourage you to read it and learn more about what's being proposed. Um, but in terms of what the outcomes of this are, um, the first thing I wanna say is that as you've noticed, this is a pretty big amount of change in either alternative in a small amount of time. And that change, amount of change is what's necessary um, in our opinion to meet the, um, the, the urgency of the need and the size, of, the, the size of the problem that's been presented to us. But the consequence of big changes is that there are a lot of people who will have opinions about them. Um, there are a lot of people who will be positively impacted. More people will be positively impacted, but also some people will be negatively impacted or will feel that they might be. And so when we propose big changes in a small amount of time, it's reasonable to expect a large, correspondingly large reaction from the part of the public. And so you should be ready 
to uh, start fielding uh, questions from your constituents, uh, concerns, all sorts of things that opinions that people might want to share, and to think about those and how they might influence your direction in August. That's the first thing I want to make sure is clear. In terms of coverage, um, there are some places where alternative A would make the bus farther away. And there are fewer of those places in alternative B. And so that's something to consider and that's gonna matter to some people. Um, now, overall, we found that both alternatives serve a similar number of people within a half mile walk of a bus stop, but that may not be how someone who has a bus stop in front of their house right now feels or is, they might not be satisfying to them. But there is a generally similar level of coverage higher in B than in A. Um, but the other thing, and the really the reason why we're doing this, is that both of these alternatives would significantly increase the number of places people can reach in a reasonable amount of time. And so we've calculated that as how many places can you get to within 45 minutes. We have, and I'll show you the results of that, but basically we're seeing that alternative, both alternatives increase access to destinations. Uh, alternative A does a little more than alternative B. Um, but just to know what I mean by access, I'll just quickly take you through this. So when we talk about access to destinations, so here's a, an image to help you through this. You may have already seen this when Jarrett presented to you, but I'll go through it quickly. So imagine a person. Imagine they're in a city or a place, you know, a community of some kind. In that community, there's all sorts of places that they might uh, want to go to or need to go to. But in the course of anyone's daily life, you only have so much time. You only have so much, and that time means that there are only so many of those places you can reach. We can map that area, and it'll look sort of like a blob on most maps from most places. Maybe it'll have a shape kind of like this. And that area can represent the, the uh, number of places you can get to uh, within a certain amount of time. So let's say 45 minutes in this case. Within that area, there are going to be a certain number of interesting and useful places. And really, it's those places within that area that structure people's most people's opportunities in life. Because if somewhere is farther than where you can get to in a reasonable amount of time, it's almost as if it weren't there on most days. So what we are trying to do in a lot of this planning here is really trying to see how can we expand this area so that people can get to more places. So I'm gonna show you how that looks like in these alternatives on uh, three different locations. So here we have the west side of Santa Cruz and you have maps on the right uh, for where you could get to now and where you can get to in future. The point where someone would start their trip here is right around Bay and Mission. Um, and this sort of purple area is where you can get to now in 45 minutes, including walking, waiting, and, and being on transit. And the blue area is where you would be able to get to in future from this location. And you can see that the blue area is larger than the purple area, and that is reflecting the fact that service is uh, twice as frequent uh, at that location and service out to the east side, out to, out to on Water Avenue and Sakel Drive is also twice as frequent. And as a result, you can get to more places in the same amount of time. So that's what that looks like from uh, the west side of Santa Cruz. Here's what it looks like from Cabrillo College in uh, Mid County. So at Cabrillo College, we've uh, replaced a situation where four buses come an hour, but effectively they come two buses every half hour to there being, there's a bus, there's another one in 10 minutes, then there's one in 20, then there's one in 10, then there's one in 20. Um, so as a result of this, uh, people can typically get a little bit farther than they can now in most directions. And particularly within 45 minutes, the thing that's most interesting here is that in both alternatives, you can reach large parts of Watsonville within 45 minutes, even including a random amount of waiting time which is not possible today. Um, you can get to more of Watsonville in alternative A than alternative B, and that's because there's service every 30 minutes uh, from Cabrillo College to both Main Street and Freedom Boulevard. In both cases, because we've reduced the frequency to the rural parts of Freedom Boulevard, it will take longer to get from Cabrillo College to those areas. So that's Cabrillo College. 
And here is from downtown Watsonville. And so from downtown Watsonville, there's a couple things to note again that are, um, so because most routes in Watsonville would be every 30 minutes, you could now arriving at a random time at the transit center, get to pretty much anywhere in Watsonville in less than 45 minutes. Um, and you could also uh, get out to Cabrillo College within 45 minutes and an alternative A with um, the higher frequency of the one and two, you could even get a little farther out, almost as far as um, Sakel Village. A little bit less in alternative B, again, because of how the one, the two would be split uh, with hourly service um, uh, on Freedom Boulevard. In both cases, again, because rural Freedom Boulevard has a cut in service, you wouldn't get as far to there. So overall, what does this mean? Here is a map that reflects kind of the, what I've been showing you previously, but calculated from every location uh, in your service area. The dots on this map represent people. So each dot is about 25 people based on where the census thinks people live. Um, so it's not exact locations, but they are not uh, made up either. They're relatively accurate locations of population densities. So where there are a lot of dots, there are a lot of people. The colors of the dots indicate whether we've made people able to reach more jobs or fewer jobs. If they're green dots, you can reach more jobs. If they're brown dots, you can reach fewer jobs in 45 minutes or less, including walking, waiting, riding, transfers. So you can see just based on the coloring of this map that there are a lot more green dots than brown dots. And that's reflected in the numbers that come out of the analysis where we're seeing that we've improved job access. And this is calculated, I should say, weekdays, daytime, uh, midday. So we've improved access for almost 70% of the population uh, of the county. And we've made a pretty significant noticeable improvement to nearly half of residents. There are a couple of small areas where that access would decrease as a result of decisions about exactly where the bus would turn and how it would go. But that number, 2% in alternative A, is much lower than the number of people who benefit. However, you should expect that people who experience a negative impact are going to feel legitimately that they are being negatively impacted. So you shouldn't expect necessarily just to hear a wave of love from this. We think that overall this is worth it, but it does have a cost. You should expect to hear about that. So this is alternative A. Here's the same map for alternative B. So here's access change in alternative A again and B again. And so you can see that in alternative B, again, it is largely a net positive, but it is not quite as much of a net positive in access. And there are slightly more people who would be negatively impacted. Um, and I guess the reason why the access change is different in alternative B than in alternative A is really about um, making those choices that lean toward coverage rather than frequency. So if you can control when you travel, having a bus that comes once an hour is okay because you'll just go and get it when it comes. But if you might just need to travel any time, which is the situation that most people are in, um, you have to go and when's the bus coming now? Uh, that lower frequency means that you wait a long time. And so these lower access numbers reflect longer waits. So that's what's being put out there in the short term. We have not yet or, um, designed what should be happening in the long term. We made a first attempt at it in the workshop, but we came to the realization that because there's different possibilities for what might happen in the short term, it's not appropriate to show the public a long-term map that reflects some short-term choices. So instead, what we are going to do now is gather the public's priorities for what are the things that matter most to you. There are a whole lot of different ideas that Metro is aware of and that the public has made us aware of for things that should happen. Maybe the 91X comes back all day. Maybe it becomes frequent. Maybe the 17 runs more often. Maybe there's better service on weekends. Maybe there's better service in the evenings. A um, whole lot of other things, right? We know all these things are out there on the table. We also know that when we look at improvements in the future this fall, we're not going to be able to do it with an infinite assumption about what kind of budget is available. We're going to have some kind of limit that we're going to have to work to. 
And because of that, we want to understand the public's priorities. So we're going to be asking the public. And uh, once we've asked the public, we're going to be asking you, um, what matters most? And so here are some of the ideas I was mentioning earlier. Uh, in addition to what I said, Better East-West Connections in Santa Cruz is a big one that we've heard a, a lot about. There may be others uh, that, are, that we hear about through this process. We're going to ask them. So if you have to pick, which, uh, which two or three of these are really the most important? And based on that, we're going to have that and an assumption about what budget to work to. And we're going to be able to show, OK, here's what we think should happen in 2024 and beyond. So we are now going out to public outreach in a couple weeks. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be asking people about these two short-term alternatives, which parts of the alternatives they prefer, um, which parts they don't like, um, anything that we've missed. And we're going to be asking them for the future um, which improvements, which types of improvements are going to matter most to them. We're going to summarize everything we hear and then bring that to you on August 25 uh, for direction. And so we're going to try to get out of that meeting with direction on what we should do in a preferred alternative that may involve mixing and matching certain parts of what's in A and B, and also what we should be focusing on for future improvements. That, so this outreach process that's happening in July and August, um, so we're starting in early July, opening up an online survey that's going to be open to the general public from early July until mid-August. On Tuesday, July 18th at 5 p.m., we'll have an online public meeting, um, and there'll be information to you shortly about how to join that meeting um, that you should feel free to relay to any and all of your constituents as you see appropriate. <clears throat> in addition, we know that online outreach isn't accessible necessarily to every community, and in particular, we know that we need to make special efforts in person um, in South County. So there'll be in-person outreach in Watsonville on July 21st targeting key locations where there are many people and many potentially interested people. So we're looking at transit center, um, the, tr the Watsonville Transit Center, the Freedom Center, uh, and the Farmer's Market. Uh, I mentioned the online survey. Uh, we'll also follow up with the rider groups and stakeholder groups that we talked to in the last phase, do focus groups showing them, well, we heard what you had to say. Here's what's on the table. What do you think? And then staff will be available during this period for any board members here who feel like you want to have your own meetings um, in your districts uh, with your constituents. So just reiterating the process, July and August, we'll do public outreach as I just spoke about. End of August, we'll ask you for direction. In the fall, we'll be working on what is the future network plan? How do we get to a world-class system? In December, uh, concurrent with the time frame for the new for the temporary relocation of Pacific Station, uh, we'll be implementing, uh, or I won't be, Metro staff, Metro will be implementing short-term service changes. Um, and in early 2024, uh, following a further board outreach and board direction, we should have a final future network plan. Thanks for your attention today. Um, I'm here for any questions, and John as well, and John may have things to add. Uh, there is a project website here where eventually we'll have links to the survey and the report. Expect the report there um, in about a week, most likely. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, there's a lot to take in there. We hope you like maps as much as Daniel and I do. Uh, there's a report, as you mentioned, we'll be releasing next week or the week after, and then we'll be in outreach for, for two months. And again, we'd encourage any board member that's interested uh, to schedule outreach meetings with us. We're looking for or, or suggest venues, et cetera, where we can talk to people. Thank you, John and Daniel. I'm going to bring it to the board for questions. What I'm hearing often is from, well, particularly in Boulder Creek, so Bruce Tully as well, students that, that so I'm thinking about outreach to schools. Perfect. And I hear from parents that the kids can get to school in the morning, but they can't get home because of if there's any after school activities. So, and I'm hearing that um, particularly, I think more so in San Lorenzo Valley, but also in Scotts Valley as well. I'm I'm, and I'm hearing now in Scotts Valley, you're probably all hearing the one change on the bus stop that, that people didn't know. And obviously we, we do all these things for outreach and people always complain that they weren't notified when a, when a stop is removed. 
and um, the one that all our council members were notified of is, is Route 35, and it was in front of St. Philip's Church. And of course, I said, well, but there's one block, not even a block away, on El Pueblo that has more employees. And then they went through um, the food pantry and some of the, the things where people have less mobility. Um, outreach to schools, I think, might be a way to send something home to parents so that it's one more step to get their participation. Um, so, and and uh, possibly if our, like in ours, our Chamber of Commerce, it has a huge out, uh, database that they can send out a notice. That might be a way to help um, connect to reach more people. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Thank you, Director Lynch, for those comments. Those are great suggestions. Uh, I, I believe we had reached out to the Chamber of Commerce in the previous round. We'll do so again. Um, outreach to schools, another great idea. The main change in the short-term alternative is more direct service uh, to Santa Cruz, so no longer have the MLN, which we were kind of put in put in a position to do recently because of our operator uh, account. Um, but given the heroic efforts of Don and HR and Margo to train, we think we'll again, add a 10% by the end of the year so we can undo that change. So that'll improve access in the San Lorenzo Valley as the map showed. I can I can meet with you after about the bus stop. That's got to drive. I appreciate all the work. And, and I every time I see a complaint, one person is saying, well, but this doesn't look like really, you have to walk half a mile. But, you know, uh, so I thank you for all you're doing. Just, I think that my biggest, I see lots of good alternatives here and, and options. Um, many of them don't affect my area as much as it will Santa Cruz Live Oak and Watsonville. But I do think the out anything we can do to, to increase that outreach um, you know, will be helpful. And I think all of us on council, we could, you know, as board members can share that with media, our own contacts and help get that information. Yeah, especially to the school <laughs> point, since we've launched the free prayer for youth, we've seen almost a doubling of weekday student membership and something like a 500% increase on weekends. Now I'm hearing really wonderful things from students, from kids in, in, in our area, just to where I think there's still a gap is San Lorenzo Valley, and understandably so. Thank you. I see um, Director Mark can have his hand up first. So, um, as a sociologist, I know that there's a propensity for people who don't like something to show up in much larger numbers than people who do like what's going on. And I'm wondering whether you'll be providing us with any sort of guidelines to understand when we get a response before August or in August, um, what it means. I mean, for example, if you had 50, 50, you know, 50% uh, love, I don't know what the numbers will be, but 50% love the new plan, love A and 50% love B or 50% love the new plan and 50% like the old, like what's going on now, um, how we would assess that. And was, you can't give us an exact guideline, but it would be helpful to know if we have a preponderance of people that are unhappy about the changes, but they're only, it only affects 2% of the people out there, how we should weigh that on some level. I don't know how to tell you how to do that or whatever, but since you have people that are experts in this kind of survey research, it would be helpful to us, I think, as a board. Sure, there are two things that people hate most, change and the way things are. <laughs> so, well, there's, a, there's a 96 page report, uh, Director Rucka, and that's coming uh, next week, but we'll definitely tease out the highlights. The main, the main issue is the increase in access, I think, between A and B. A, because it leans more towards uh, frequency, provides more access, more reachable destinations within that 45 minutes, and B, a little bit less. So that's the main takeaway, but it, we for sure will I, it, it was a really good presentation, and I think it's really clear what the options mean. I just worried about a situation where we show up at an August meeting and have a huge crowd of people, who, you know, the larger, you know, the preponderance of people there hate the new plans, but they represent 2% of the public. Yeah. Um, I think, Director Rotkin, so there's a couple things. Um, first of all, I, I, your point is very well taken and that's kind of what i was trying to get at by saying big change is going to lead to big reaction right you you always hear more from people who are negatively impacted by a change than from all the people who are positively impacted uh they're more likely to be alerted and they're more likely to have big feelings and they're more likely to get in touch about them 
Um, it is not really possible for us to give you an exact number of like, well, we heard 50-50, so you should assume 70-30. We can't really yeah. do that in quantitative terms. Right. But I think you should be aware of that. I think this is also why it's important for you as directors to, um, to the extent possible, take the time to absorb the material uh, about this so you will understand, it, you know, from an analytical point of view, what's going on um, and what the big picture is. Um, and then, you know, ultimately there is a moral decision at play here. And we, you know, the, and this is why, why you all are, are, uh, are in the position you're in, why you're directors, there's a moral choice about, is it okay for um, the people who are going to be negatively impacted to be negatively impacted in service of the larger number of people who will be positively impacted? I, I as a consultant can in no way answer this question. I don't think staff can answer this question, but someone needs to answer it because the alternative is to not make any change. And we know that that's a deficient situation too. Thanks. Thanks for your response. Again, that was a really excellent report. Thank you. Okay. The report, Daniel and John. Um, I'll definitely take you up on the offer to come to a meeting this month, August 10th at Simpkins Swim Center. So in the heart of Live Oak, be affected by, you know, alternative A versus alternative B. Um, so we'd love to have you guys come to that and get some direct feedback. Um, I, I love the new number scheme proposed with the, you know, routes one, two, three. I think it's a little easier, at least for someone accessing the system for the first time than figuring out 69A, W, 77. Um, I'm just curious why it wasn't extended to the whole system. Is there like some justification why UCSC is still 1819 or preserving some of the numbers in other parts of seems like Watsonville? Uh, you know, why not just keep going four, five, six? Sure. Daniel can maybe add to this. I think the main reason is we weren't changing everything in UCSC and Watsonville, whereas the main uh, inner city routes between Watsonville and Santa Cruz, we were configuring all of those. So there were still other routes in Watsonville that were changed, weren't changing or were changing less. So we kept that numbering scheme, which is all the 70s. And same thing on the west side. But we would definitely be open to renumbering everything. I think these the, and these numbers now are placeholder, but we do think one, two, three is is clearer than it is today. So it's, it's definitely something we can revisit. All right. Um, and then my last question is: um, we see, you know, that we're talking about the two percent people that might be negatively impacted. Uh, you know, versus 69 percent positively impacted. Just wondering, was the negative impact? Um, does that take into account Terra Cruz riders? Um, because you know, I know if we if we remove some stops, then that could also affect you know, the distance that Terra Cruz would go, um, would go and who it could pick up. So, just want to make sure we are taking into account that part of the service as well, especially because uh, Terra Cruz riders might rely to a greater extent on our service than. Um, maybe some of more alternatives. Yeah, so we wouldn't be changing the Paracruz uh, service area with either alternatives. Um, the three quarter mile would stay the same, and it'd be the same uh, network, as, um, same service area as today. Paracruz area would actually expand a little bit in Watsonville, where there are a couple areas uh, where service is added in both alternatives. Um, just as an added point to that, I think I, I wouldn't hang too hard on the exact number of 2% and 4%. Those are the exact number of people who would be impacted in terms of how you count that specific job access within a certain amount of time measure. And that's intended to reflect that more people are positively impacted than negatively. But different people will have different definitions of what it means to be negatively impacted. Some people will think that their negative impact is simply that the bus stop that used to be in front of their house isn't there anymore, even if their actual ability to use the transit system uh, is the same or improved more broadly because of where they could get to. So, um, yeah, just want to add that. I hear you. Some people might see it as a negative impact and now have to walk five minutes even if the bus is coming more frequently. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. And then I see Dr. McPherson and then. Yeah, with, um, with the, the timeline, and uh, this is looking far beyond, this is what we have now on Highway 9. Um, do you have any indication or uh, guesswork of when we complete the bus on shoulder that's being planned on Highway 9 up to Freedom Boulevard, for instance, would that improve the time frame Santa Cruz to Watsonville? 
I doubt that you took this into account, but what's your guesstimate? Would it improve that situation? So, Director McPherson, I think you're referring to the Highway 1 uh, bus on shoulder, not Highway 9. Um, Correct. Yeah. So, the we think it'll improve the travel time in two ways. Uh, one, uh, the studies from RTC suggest a two to four minute travel time savings on the highway segment. So, not substantial, but a, a dramatic increase in reliability because the bus will be able to stay out of traffic mostly. Um, and then we're going to reroute and provide a more direct uh, service that operates on the entirety of Highway 1 between Watsonville and Santa Cruz, and that'll reduce the travel time by about 15 minutes over the current 90 miles. So in the alternative B, I think that Daniel proposed, that is the proposal that's in there. It's not the old 91X that went to Cabrillo because we're providing uh, an equal amount of service there uh, between the one and two routes. Um, it's a direct route between Santa Cruz and Watsonville, but limited, limited span period only and only once an hour, which is what we can do with existing resources. But the future plan and what we, um, the improvements that were funded as part of our TERSIP award in April uh, are hinged on 15 minute peak period frequency by 2028 in that corridor. And so that's, that's the future direction of where we're trying to go in that corridor. But we don't have the resources to do that in December. Thank you, Director Anderson. Uh, two questions. Can Metro deliver the proposed alternatives like current resources, or do they need to be staff up? Do you need anything else? Or can they be delivered right now today with the current resources? And then also, can the board review and provide feedback to the draft survey before it goes out to the public in July? Survey? Yeah, we'd be happy to provide the draft survey to the board. Um, the alternatives are the assumption is a 10% increase over today. And by all indications, we'll be there within the next two months in terms of operators, in terms of the operators we need to operate that service. So we might even get there by September, October, but it's, do you want to add anything to that, Michael? Yeah, I mean, the, the current class should get you your 10% increase. And if I'm not mistaken, they're due to graduate and actually be in, the, in service in, in, in September. Problem. Yeah. Well, we're about three weeks, and then we have an upcoming class of 17. So we're looking at a number of 160. So that puts us over pre COVID by the end of the year in terms of the number of operators. There's a contingency if, if something were to happen and you didn't hit that 10% mark, we could push the short term launch until uh, March. And that's a good thought, Diane. Yeah. Um, we'll see where we are in September. And if, if we have to do that, we'll do that. The reason we want to push it in December is that's when we're coming out of the station. Part of the contingency is we'll be at 160. The, this change is budgeted at around 155 in terms of number of operators. So there's some give there. Okay. Uh, I think we're in a really good place to deliver this in December. I don't, I don't really have any doubts about us being able to do it. Uh, my question's about outreach. I noticed you had a lot of different options. And they're all great, thank you. Um, I always have concerns about the people who are not heard from because they can't get to a Zoom meeting or they're not at farmer's market or they don't have a lot of online opportunities and they may not even know about it because they're so busy just trying to work, take the bus or not. I mean, if they could take the bus, they may not even know they can take the bus because um, they live in an area where there isn't any service. And so I don't know if you have anything additional uh, that could be made available to people. I, I know mailing, slow mail is hard, but I just wondered if you had considered other options, um, if there's things that we as board members can do um, with our county supervisors, because I live in you know, the second district, and um, so anything you can do to help us reach those other people that don't, don't necessarily, because a lot of times people who go to Zoom meetings and all those other things, they have an opinion, as you said, some of these folks that are negatively impacted. And other people are pretty clueless because they didn't know about it or they just don't have time. And those are the folks that may be more impacted by some of these changes. So just looking for help. 
and we're looking for your help as well. Okay. So there's only one Zoom meeting uh, planned. Zoom is online is not the focus of outreach. Uh, the particular focus is going to be in Watsonville in person. So the farmers markets, the strawberry festival. Um, as the, in part of the first round of outreach, the consultant team built a list of I think 33 uh, community stakeholder social service organizations to push the message out as well. Um, and so that's going to be a big part of this outreach effort. And besides just pushing the information out to invite uh, in for in person or whatever venue is appropriate, attend attend already scheduled meetings. Uh, Etc. To, to get what are we going to have inside the buses to tell people? So we'll have we'll have car cards. We'll have the survey link. Um, we'll have surveyors uh, on board at certain times. Not not a huge presence planned right now because we're going to focus more on the in-person events in Watsonville. But in the first round, we actually had surveyors ride ride the seventy one sixty nine. As we know, uh, people don't take online surveys, um, and often. To get the response, we have to be there in person, filling out the survey responses for the for the person. So it's it's a very time consuming effort. But that's the only way that get responses. Okay. You have to say right. um, I want I want to thank you for the presentation. It was very useful, and I'm very much looking forward to the ninety six page report. And then we have a lot of questions. But but one thing that does come to mind, and I'm highlighting this for Danielle. Um, Making any significant changes in the middle of an academic year is a challenge for both Cabrillo College and UCSC. Uh, already, the UCs are preparing orientation for incoming students who will arrive in September. Uh, they'll live with the system as, as it is today for three months, and then they'll be reoriented to a new system. From what we saw today, it looks like that may be less significant than the UC area, but Real college could have some significant changes. So keeping mindful of how to do the outreach and reorientation and information distribution to those big populations of writers will be a, a good task come December. Thank you, Daniel. Sure. <laughs> the timing is not ideal, so there's a big disruption coming in December. So we I, I almost think it'll be a positive because we'll have students already on campus That's during that first semester. We'll have the ability to talk to people directly. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I have a few questions and then I have some comments. So I'm wondering if we have any nonprofit partners that would be willing to help us do the surveying because I think a lot of the populations that we're looking for um, are served by some nonprofits. So I'm just wondering if there's any partnership there. So I'm, as I mentioned, there's this list of 30 or so uh, stakeholders. I'd be happy to share it with you to review to see if we're missing any. And we are working with Ecology Action on the in-person outreach to provide Spanish language assistance in lots of them. And there will be those um, focus groups with those stakeholder organizations where the team will be able to have a more in-depth conversation with those nonprofits and uh, you know see what it is that they need in terms of being able to push out the outreach to the populations they serve. Um, I'm wondering about the fall pool. So I saw that it was a thousand individuals, and I'm wondering if there's numbers for how many people in Watsonville were surveyed. Um, I saw that there was people <coughs> surveyed in person, but I'm just wondering out of that thousand, what how many were surveyed? Twenty that were surveyed. It was a telephone poll of a thousand residents. Okay, so that was evenly distributed throughout the county. That wasn't an online. Poll. No, no, it was a telephone survey. Um, so I'm hoping that we can get an online survey because I'm hearing a lot of assumptions about Watsonville that are really frankly insulting. Um, and <laughs> we have internet, people know how to use the internet. There's certain populations, of course, that don't, but online surveys work really well in Watsonville um, because people share them, they use social media. So I would really push for that, especially for uh, our part of the county. Um, and I have to say that I'm really disappointed. And what I saw today, I, I'm wondering why there's not a frequency of 15 minutes in Watsonville. We simply don't have the resources to do it with today. Um, okay. But there is a, it is in the future plan, which we're not showing yet, mm -hmm. uh, which we're building on this summer. Uh, but basically those two lines, one and two, mm -hmm. would move to 15 minutes in the future. Okay, plan. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that because that what I saw is not equitable and it's unacceptable. Um, so I live in front of a bus stop, and from my bus stop, if I were to take the bus, 
it would take me 45 minutes to get anywhere that I needed to go, assuming that's the fast, fastest I could do it, but I can walk anywhere within 25 minutes. And that's shameful. That's embarrassing. Um, I'm on this board to represent people who actually use the service. And I don't think it's rocket science that people don't use the service because it's not there. Um, and that's not to say I'm not trying to disparage. I'm just really frustrated because I see people outside my house every single day waiting to use the bus. The bus doesn't come, they gotta get somewhere and they walk. Um, I see you know, people with disabilities, I see mothers with children, I see students, and those are the people that we need to serve. Um, again, I, I was just hearing some kind of disturbing assumptions about Watsonville and really, really challenged you to think about Watsonville. We don't just exist in Watsonville and come to Santa Cruz to live our lives. We live our lives in our town, in our city, in our community. Um, and we need to be served. We need that. We need to be able to hop on a bus and to get to the grocery store or to go to the city building or to go to the post office. And that's not happening. Um, so I would just really challenge you to think about equity and think about who you're serving um, and think about, you know, people that really need the service that don't use it because it doesn't exist. And that's why. Um, and we, you know, we are a really engaged community. So I really don't like those assumptions that I hear. So I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you for those comments. And, and in both alternatives, we are looking to double the frequency on most of the local service within Watsonville. So currently, as, as Daniel showed in the map, there's basically only hourly routes except for the 71. Um, and essentially all of the routes, the 79 would go for an hourly to 30 minutes. Uh, the 72 and the 75 would be scheduled to be every 30 minutes on Green Valley. Um, and then there'd be two 30 minute routes uh, on Freedom and on Maine. So it, it, it is a pretty significant, we spent a lot of time in Watsonville and if we missed the point, if we missed the priorities, there's there's absolutely time to revisit that and revisit our approach towards outreach. The assumption that we need to be in person that online doesn't work quite as well was our experience in the first round and our experience with other, what we've heard from other organizations is list of 33 that <coughs> overwhelmingly we heard online doesn't work, we need to be there in person. We're gonna have both options. The online survey is gonna watch next I week. Again, those are assumptions that yeah. I'm telling you as a yeah. person who lives in Watsonville or represents Watsonville, I constantly get, where are the surveys? Where, why is it online? Is there a link? Can I share it? That's yeah. what I do. Yeah. So it'll, it'll absolutely be online. We just, based on what we heard in the first round, and it, it may be erroneous, but we're, we're making a bigger effort to try to be there in person. Your comments, Dr. Duca. And we're doing our general plan right now, and we're going to survey in lots of Okay, so thank you. I have some comments and then some questions, and then I guess a final comment. I first want to say I appreciate the, the writer that came today to speak from Watsonville. I mean, my journey was 40 minutes in a car that I drove with, you know, and I can only imagine how long it took her to get here to come and speak. And so um, I want to say thank you. And those are the writers that we need to be prioritizing as we move forward as a board, you know. Um, and she was speaking, you know, on behalf of a, um, a, a part of our community that it was has disabilities, and and, um, and that should be important to us. Um, as I say, I repeat this all the time. The ninety one X is very important to me. I feel that we went to the students at Cabrillo, and we promised them if they, um, you know put some sort of fee on themselves, we would secure the 91X. I remember our bus drivers were out there. Everyone was, was out there um, advocating for this and then we stripped the 91X. And um, that really, as you saw today, um, not only affects students, but it also affects other people as well, who, um, and quite frankly, more people are trying to get from Watsonville to Santa Cruz because they work there than people working, going from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. Um, you know, so we have to keep that in mind as well, you know, that where the group of people are coming from to travel. Um, I may have read this incorrectly, but I think in plan B, it looks like um, one of the routes was cut. Um, can you pull the B, the, the back up? Sure. On, on the highway, one and two, it looks like I think one was removed. Can we share Daniel's screen again? Just one or two. Give me a second okay. to get to the right. Um, slide here so we can make sure we are talking about the same thing. Um, so let's see. So, A, yes, one and two. See how you have on highway one, one and two? Um, they're both at a frequency 
of 30 minutes, looks like. Yep. And then you yep. go to the next slide. <laughs> Two is now goes down to 60 minutes. Yeah, so the is reason that, that wrong? No, that's correct. So the reason for that is A is leaning towards frequency. So there's two, one and two operate every 30 minutes between Santa Cruz and Watsonville. What B does is it brings back a peak period 91X and a rural freedom, basically the 71 Watsonville to Santa Cruz returns. Whereas in A, rural freedom is Cabrillo, uh, Cabrillo College to downtown. So those lines don't mean north down, south down. That they're just thrown up there to. Lines. See how there's two. I, my eyes are bad, but yeah, I can still see two. Lines. two <laughs> that's correct. There are there's two 30 minute routes on Highway One in A, and in B, there's one 30 minute route, and it's and one peak period 91x and one hourly route. So I guess my, you know, I I I, read, I, I saw that you were doing you were only going to operate those three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening. I mean. That doesn't do, I mean, that doesn't do the community that we're supposed to serve, to give us the best service, you know, to get us up and down, up and down the county. Um, so, I mean, I really think that we should really focus how we can improve this. Um, I mean, this has been something, this is the route that was proposed. And so, um, I, I hope that when you go back and you can, you know, make this a priority. Um, I know that uh, we're having our national night out coming up. There's hundreds of people go to it. There's two locations. There's going to be one off of Green Valley Road, that we call it Mesa Village. So um, that's coming up. I already got the um, flyer for it, August. That's the first Tuesday of August. And then I think the city of Watsonville, just um, we do ours. Oh, ours also on August 1st. They do a big one um, on downtown. Um, and so you'll get a lot more people than at the, uh, um, the farmers market, Great. and I think those—that's a target um, group that you're going to want to you're going to want to make sure you you address. Um, and I just wanted, I guess, a comment to make about that. You know, over the last twenty years, we've decreased service by thirty percent. I mean, if we're trying to really reduce our carbon footprint here in this community, that we're going the wrong way. And um, if we want to make sure that we're keeping people, um, you know, wanting to use our service, we're doing the wrong thing. So um, I'm not surprised that people have moved away from writing our service to other alternative <clears throat> methods of getting to where they need to be because we've cut our service by 30%. That is crazy. I, when I saw that today, I was really, really astonished. So, um, and, I, and, 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 I, and I don't know if other parts of the county um, you know, kind of address or, or, or experience the same that we do, but I was just, you know, when I drive by like on College Road, there's a bus stop that's on literally the side of a, a hill. And there was a woman standing there with all her bags on the side of the hill. I was like, oh my God, is this how we treat our people? Like we have to make her stand on the side of a dirt hill? Like, I don't know if that happens in any other part of the community, but like, I'd love to tour all the bus stops and see. People sit on that porch. <laughs> like, we need to address that with more, you know, bus stops or in Watsonville, a lot of the times it's just a pole. Um, you know, and, and these are sometimes elderly people who are having to stand there as we're saying 30, 60 minutes to wait for a bus to get to them. So I think we really need to, you know, kind of, as we, um, my, my colleague was saying, you know, talk about equity throughout the whole county. I agree for the city to step up too and get some bus stops that are great bus stops on their roads when they do their complete streets. With you guys? How does? They should be participating in creating bus stops and their streets. Yeah, but we're the, I mean, we're the Metro service. I mean, so we're the ones that we should, we should initiate here. I mean, the city is not the one buying bus stops. If this is, I mean, I've never heard that a city, does the city of Santa Cruz buy bus stops and put them in? Yeah, that's right, like other cities have put in bus stops and developers have to. Maybe in different, you know, the locations where you were, but do they do it here in Santa Cruz County? I don't know, but I, I know you got a massive fiscal deficit coming up and you got a lot of problems. And so you guys really need to prioritize. And I agree with you. Uh, Director Dutra, the biggest problem with this agency is between 2002 and even pre-COVID numbers, not even including all the declines in pre-COVID, we reduced the service hours in this system, 50,000 service hours over that time period. Well, so it's, it's time to start talking to the public. It's time to start talking to our member agencies about supporting the agency 
as they do that development. And I think for the most part, they do. We put in conditions of approvals all the time for bus stops that then the cities uh, work with the developer to get in the cars. Well, all I was asking was for equity across the board and get pushback saying that it's upon the city to, to do it. And that needs to be a conversation that needs to come to the board because yeah. This is something that's new. So. I don't think it's only the city, but the city has, uh, it's their streets, and they have the ability to go after grants. They have the ability to talk to developers. They have a lot of tools in their tool bag to assist the agency. I'm not saying it's all their problem, but I'm saying if that's a big emphasis of yours, and I think it should be, then you should be talking to the city manager. Well, these people are running our service. Why is that not, uh, that's not part of priority for us to make sure that we're taking care of them? They don't have Okay. But we to put a bus stop in, don't we have bus stops? I mean, we're, we're upgrading our bus stops. I've had this conversation. But you want to give them a place to sit and put in the ADA improvements and give them a place of shade? That's a $50,000. Well, stop. we just built on Freedom Boulevard, and we had this conversation, you and I, a brand new bus stop, which I'm sure they right. did not pay for. Right? right? So that that should have a bus stop coming in to, to make sure that people are being taken care of. As we move forward, when we approve de developments in Watsonville, we require this, you know. Yeah, so I'm just I mean, saying your biggest problem here at Metro is you've reduced the service hours, fifty thousand service hours over twenty years. That's what your public is saying was the service. Yeah, and that's why I'm, I've also <coughs> talked about service, but I'm also you know talking about across the board. If we're putting in bus stops in Santa Cruz, we should also go in Watsonville. And I know they're putting them in Santa Cruz. So that's all I'm saying. Thank you, um, Dr. Dusan. I want to thank uh, Dan Dunn uh, for the presentation. It was a great presentation. I had a, just a um, quick question. I noticed on alternative B that um, uh, Route 18 was changed to every 15 minutes, and then 19 and 10 were kept to 30. I was just wondering what uh, went into that decision. I think I know. Yeah, it's just a, again the trade off between leaning towards frequency and leaning towards coverage. And A, uh, the Eliminate service on High Street for right. the 10 and mm -hmm. add that service at 18 19 to bring it both up to 15 minutes. And then B, we keep service on the 10 right. on High Street. But not only it enables us to do one route to 18 to 15 minutes. Right. So that's and, and 18, which is oh, that's what my question. Why was the 18 chosen instead of the 19? Uh, because the 18 is the has the highest demand of any metro route in the system. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Director Koenig, and then um, I also have some questions and comments if all directors are complete. Very good. Just one quick follow-up question. Um, looking at the one and the two going from Watsonville North, first of all, that, I assume that those are two separate routes. They're both going north and south, right? Um, so because they're both 30-minute services, could they be overlapped in a way to effectively create a 15-minute route at least between Watsonville and, I mean, Cabrillo? Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry. So they will depart every 15 minutes from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. So from the Watsonville Transit Center, it's every 15 minutes uh, to points north. Um, same thing, points south, Santa Cruz down. Because of the different routes they take, one Freedom Airport and one Maine, uh, the schedule gets a little off by the time they get to Cabrillo. So that's why Daniel was showing a purple line instead of a red at every 10 to 20 minutes, which you could extend that purple line all the way through Highway 1. It's there's no stops there, so it's not really useful to show that. Um, but through that stretch from 41st to State Park, there's pretty close to 15 minute service. We just didn't want to say it's exactly 15 minute service because of the different routes that, the, the different streets that they take in Moscow. So it's 10 to 20 minutes effectively, plus every. Got it. I mean, I'm just going to uh, Director uh, Heroes Carter's comment like, there's no red lines in Watsonville, but this, you know, the double blue. Double dark blue is function functionally getting close. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Um, it's much closer functionally to that in alternative A than in alternative B from the perspective of Watsonville Transit Center. Um, because the one and the two stay together uh, for long and the two doesn't branch, um, it means that at Watsonville Transit Center, you have arrivals and departures not almost every 50 minutes, not quite. It's actually probably closer to 10 and 20 in alternative A. Um, in alternative B, because the two branches out and some of it goes on Freedom Boulevard and others on Highway 1, there's a big difference in time. And so actually you're getting closer to that 20 or 30 minute time interval uh, between departures uh, going um, eastward or northward, however you want to do that. 
And you see this in the access analysis for a person standing at Cabrillo College under alternative A, there's much more access improvement on Airport Freedom and Main Street than there is in alternative B. And that's due to the branching of the routes in alternative B. And alternative B. So even though alternative B brings back the 91X, A actually provides more access uh, to residents of Baltimore. Or from this map, uh, the jobs and residents of Watsonville are from the real college. You see the blue, there's more blue on. Yeah, Chuck, so this is at Watsonville. If you keep this up, I mean, it's, I would love to see a map where we can, you know, basically say that from Watsonville, you get to downtown Santa Cruz in 45 minutes. Um, so for that, is, is that going to be like long term planning, more resources kind of a thing that we can effectuate that? Um, so this, the travel time assumptions here include wait time. You know, you show up randomly to the transit center and, and try to catch a bus. So in a 30, when the route's every 30 minutes, the average wait time is 15 minutes. The route's every 60 minutes, like on the 91X alternative B, it's every 30 minutes. So that's factored into the coverage here. If you're a person that knows when you're going to catch that bus exactly, then you'd reduce 15, 30 minutes from this map. So you're, you're going farther. I mean, the travel time, is about an, a little over an hour still on both routes, about an hour, I think. Yeah. So, but part of what you're seeing here is walking, waiting, transit rides, not just the time on the bus. So I think it's going to feel a little bit longer to a transit rider, to someone that says, oh, I, I know when to catch the bus, and then I, I'm just thinking about my on-bus trip time. But that's not the way the typical person experiences the system or a new person that just wants to leave, not, not tie their life and their day the bus schedule, essentially. Um, if I might add just for that, if, to give you a goalpost for that, um, that goal of like, can you get from Watsonville Transit Center to downtown Santa Cruz in say 45 minutes, including waiting, to make that possible, you'd really need an all day service running at least every 30 minutes, nonstop on highway one between the two, maybe even not even stopping on main street on the way there like you need you you really need higher frequency all day um and skipping as much as possible of the stops on the way if that's if that's the priority thank you thank you um i have just a couple of questions and then we'll take it to public comment and then close this agenda item um thank you for the presentation and the work so far and this was clear and thorough and uh, clearly, we have more work to do, and, and I see the plan for the work that's coming. Um, I don't, I didn't hear this, but I uh, wanted to ask specifically, are our surveyors bilingual? Okay. And then um, I didn't see this on the map because we weren't covering the whole county, but are there any all um, recommendations for North Coast or Bonnie Dune? Will those routes be affected? Not in the short-term plan. Not in the short-term plan. resources. Okay. This is a little bit outside of what you're presenting, but do we have the capacity to put e-bikes on our buses right now and will be in the future? So I have an e-bike, it's 80 pounds. I do try to put it on the bus at times. It's exceedingly challenging. Um, so they fit, it's just, it's- Okay. Yeah. All right, so so we do have the capacity. It's whether it's we, hard. the person has the, the <laughs> strength. Um, and then just to reiterate, um, Director Lynn's comments around um, outreaching to youth and young adults they will be an important voice and as we see they're um, taking advantage of the youth cruise free program and they will be our future ridership so just to reiterate that we should reach out to them and i know john you met with the copa youth um, as we did so that's that's a great group and as well as the schools um, and then also to say that i would be happy to and probably a lot of other directors to do the outreach for, through social media newsletters for what's coming um, and then just the last comment that I, I learning what I've learned, I'm going to take this to the work that I'm doing with my city council on the housing element, because I think all of our jurisdictions are revising our housing element. And it's a good opportunity for us to think big picture of what transit's going to look like in the future, um, how we want our communities to say the word grow. Um, in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but there is an intersectionality there of housing and transit. And as each of us go back to our jurisdictions, let's think about that. I mean, your comments around bus stops, that made me think about that. Like, how are we thinking about transit corridors? Where are they? Where are they not? Where is our housing? So 
just a reminder for myself and an invitation to others to, to, um, to look at housing element and other opportunities that, that we have before us as we make policy decisions. I think that's that's the end of my comments. Any last comments from directors before I take it out? To but just, I know there have been no upgrades, and, you're, and I'm thinking the same thing you are. We've had no upgrades to our bus stops in 20 years or more. Most of them are not covered. Most don't have a bench. But we do have housing coming in, and it can be tied to the developer to fund those things exactly. as all part of that project. So this, with all the housing that we're having to deal with, it's overwhelming, but this is the time to be looking at transit. And there's new state laws around parking requirements. So there, right. there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to Park. push in our local there's jurisdictions. Need to that with our new development, they, yes. they're building the bus stops or they have to pay a fee. So right. we already do that. So I think every city should, city should do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We just haven't had projects along those routes. Right. Yeah, yeah. the corridors that have come to bus stop. They're yeah. coming with our they new are now. So. <laughs> All right, so with that, I'll see if there's anyone in the um, public who'd like to comment on this <clears throat> presentation. Um, may I add a couple comments regarding equity? Uh, yeah, just, mom just a moment. We have some one from the public. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't an impression that we hadn't been looking at equity in the course of this work. I think that equity is obviously a really broad topic that incorporates a lot of issues in people's lives. And I don't want to pretend like just changing where the lines go on a map addresses everything, but I want to tell you at least what we've done. Um, there was a quick, there was a question earlier about the Spanish language surveying. I also want to point out that all the surveying materials online uh, will be available in Spanish as well. The public meeting is happening in English and simultaneously in Spanish with a native Spanish speaker who is also a transit expert who I work with every day. So just want to put that out there. Also in the analysis, and this will be shown in the report. I only had so many so much time so much of your time I wanted to take today. We've also uh, looked at how this impacts differentially between the average resident versus residents of color, low income, low income residents, uh, Latino residents specifically. And so we are able to show based on all of those measures that the positive impacts are generally felt more strongly among all of those marginalized populations um, than among the average residents. So that's not a complete answer. It doesn't, doesn't have to satisfy you. There, you have, it's perfectly within your remit to feel that more should be done. Uh, but I just want you to know that this has, is an inherent part of the process and that we are looking at it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, over to you, Brandon. All right, here we go. So first of all, man, you guys are flying with my boy, Jonathan. You got to calm down a little bit with that. John has a lot of things he has to deal with, right? We have politicians who come in, you're worried about your constituents, your constituents he has to deal with that. You've got to deal with me and probably the most restrictive labor contract there is when it comes to scheduling stuff. He doesn't always get to make the decisions that you want him to make because I won't let him. In addition to that, there's also the database stuff, right? So when we're talking about equity and we're talking about the future of the transit, when we look at it from a purely numbers standpoint, it is nobody's fault that the university is a massive amount of our ridership. That's why it's getting 15 minutes service first. It's not because we don't want to do it, it's because we have to do certain things based on what we have. The overall biggest thing for me, and I pulled these numbers up so that we can actually get exact numbers. In 2002, fixed route serves 6,270,000 rides. By 2012, we were down to 5.5 million. And in 2022, we were down to 2.775, okay? So we're dropping massive amounts of ridership in a 20 year period. Our bus stops haven't changed. They're exactly how they were 20 years ago, and that's a problem. It is. But the bigger problem that we have is that our system is not serving the community. No one here is able to just stand up and say, this is exactly what's going to work for us. So it is extremely important that we do get feedback from every area that we possibly can. We had a week-long event where we came up with this plan, and everyone was invited. And I'm sorry to say it, but only one representative from Watsonville showed up in the three days. And what they told us was, you need to go in person because Watsonville doesn't like to do things online. They don't like to call it. They don't like to do these things. So these were not assumptions that we made. These were things that we we're doing based on what our experience was and what we were told by your own representatives. Representatives that work here 
and have access to these meetings on a monthly basis and decide not to attend. So we're not trying to make assumptions for you. We're not trying to be inequitable, but I don't think that it's fair for John to take the heat for all of these problems when we've offered multiple times. I myself have stand here and I invited every single one of you to these meetings. Rebecca shows up, Larry shows up, Shebra likes to have an email. I haven't heard anything from anyone else, not a single thing. We are not keeping you out. You are allowed to come, you are allowed to voice for your constituents, but it is not fair for you to come up here and burn the staff when we're working our asses off trying to get the best deal possible and you won't show up to help us. So I would like you to think about that before we move any further. Thank you. Thank you. We'll close that agenda item. And we will move to agenda item 15. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, adopt the resolution to amend Title II of the Administrative Code Procurement Policy to increase the CEO General Manager's procurement authority. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be taking this on behalf of staff, although your purchasing manager, Joe Jeffries, is in the audience if you have any questions. Um, so at this time, the CEO's uh, procurement authority is 50000 or less. And that's been in place for almost a decade. And um, it's been on our wish list, in our, I mean, staff primarily, to increase that threshold so that Lower value contracts don't need to be brought to the board. You know, staff has to wait for the board cycle, which is only once a month, in order to move forward with lower value projects. And then, of course, secondarily, prepare board materials, which takes time. Um, and so staff was thinking about asking for more authority for the CEO. Originally, we were thinking 100,000. We've been kicking this around for a few years. Um, but then last month, the board approved 200,000 or less for public works contracts under the Kupka process. Mm -hmm. And so we all thought, wouldn't it be nice to have just one number that staff would have to keep track of? So they wouldn't have to keep track of when does it go to the board, when does it not? If there's just 200,000 or less, it does not need to go to the board, regardless of the type of contract it is. And if it's more, it does go to the board. Um, obviously, you all have the ability to you know, choose that number because it's your authority that's being delegated, uh, but that's the thinking behind it. And then staff included a table to show you, you know, where similarly situated agencies are. And you can see, you know, there's really no one almost, sorry, Scotts Valley is still at 50,000. Um, but other than Scotts Valley, everybody is at a minimum 100. And then, you know, goes up to a million, obviously, which that, that's a huge agency. Um, but, you know, in the 200, 100 to 200 range is, is pretty common. And um, other than that, there's there were some revisions that were made to the protest policy in 2021 that actually didn't wind up getting put into the administrative code. So that's why the lines on the protest policy you already approved those several years ago. We just caught that issue when we were doing these updates. And with yeah. that, I can answer questions or Joan can answer yeah. questions. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Directors, I have a question. Um, if you were, do you have any thoughts of advantages versus disadvantages making this policy? Yeah, I think like from, you know, from my point of view, and I don't care, whatever, it doesn't matter to me, but from staff's point of view, administratively having one number to keep track of, I think would be really helpful. Um, and you could always ask for, you know, quarterly reports or something to keep an eye on like what, what is going on. <clears throat> if you wind up thinking like things are out of control, you can always pull it back. Um, yeah, all the contracts are still run through legal. You know, we have eyes on everything. Um, you know, and if there was ever a time where there was a project that was controversial, for example, you know, you could say, like, we really want this one to come before the board um, because we want to have a substantive conversation about it. 
Um, but if I were staff, I would love to have one number. Would um, would it be I, for me? I would. I, I'm fine with the number, but I want to know when maybe a certain amount or a hundred good number, just so that we're aware of it. I mean, it's in the check register and all that, but but I think maybe maybe a notification of a certain amount, just so that you know we're keeping tabs on it. I don't know if that's monthly or quarterly, but I think that would be useful. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that was part of the plan is oh, that okay. Michael would be um, keeping a list of anything above that. You say 100K, I think that's a great idea. Anything above that threshold that he has awarded on his own authority, he would bring that to you guys in the CEO report on a monthly basis. So they would definitely be keeping track. Um, so what's the um, annual budget? 60. And um, since that's similar to, I guess, the cities. So we're going to give an extra 100,000 above what the, the cities in our people, except for Scotts Valley, um, for automatic approval by the CEO. We're going to be I mean, should we not be consistent with the rest of Santa Cruz County? Or, I mean, that's, um, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think projects over 100,000 should be brought to us to, to make a decision. I think that's, that's a pretty big amount. I just, just a reminder, you, are, you have already approved construction projects. 200,000 and, and above or and below which are already authorized to the CEO. Mm -hmm. Just just to remind you of that. So this is like services and stuff. With stuff. And stuff. Supplies, materials, and equipment. Oh. Director Rockin. Yeah, uh, when I first my unmuted yes when i first yeah. got on the transit board I, I was you know deeply concerned that the board see everything and you know we not sort of trust everything to take care of itself i, I read the entire budget carefully including we do the check register every every meeting and i have to say we, we should just recognize that the cost of doing things has just gone up dramatically and it really does tie up our staff when they have to come to us and in all of my experience, we have never challenged one of those decisions, literally, in, in my 30 plus year, 32 years on the board or something. And it, it, I have a lot of confidence in our staff. I do like the idea that we would hear about the ones that are over that number. Um, you know, I mean, over, over 100K in the, the um, CEO's report. But I really don't think we, that, it, honestly, that it's really necessary for us to look through those things. I don't think the board really will do that. Um, in any serious way. And the, the, the price of doing things has just gone up really, really dramatically, including not just the capital projects that we've already approved, but the, the contract for someone to do some work that we want to have done quickly. And it, it takes two months to do it when it could be done in a month if we didn't do this kind of thing. So I support this, but, you know, pending hearing from the public about it, I, I think this is reasonable. And I, have, I don't have any uh, fear that somehow we're going to have money, you know, money being spent that we wouldn't approve. It obviously still has to be spent consistent with our budget. It's not like you can just, you know, come up with a brand new idea on his the CEO cannot just come up with an idea of his own and go out and spend two hundred thousand dollars. It has to be something that we're in general have approved the sort of activity. But the, the, the specific contract coming to us because it's only a you know it goes over a hundred thousand, I think it's it's past time to move it to the higher number. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Anyone from the public? Okay, bring it back to the board. Uh, I'll move that we approve the staff recommendation. Second. Okay, first and second. Yes. Director Brown? Aye. Director Downey? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colin Perry Johnson? Aye. Director Cohen. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. 
Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Kiros Carter? Aye. And Director Rockman? Aye. And motion passes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. We are moving on to item 16, and that is our CEO oral report. Right. Your treat. All right. Well, um, you know, I uh, I just want to back up just a little bit, and I'm not sure we ended on a real great note with the planning stuff, but I got to tell you, it's what gets me excited about being here because um, I just envision building a much better metro and having lots of people be able to enjoy that 15 minute service that is kind of the sweet spot that you want on these key corridors. And uh, so, you know, I'm full steam ahead with that. Uh, these things that you looked at today were meant to be really minor adjustments. And what really was meant as the sweet spot of Jared Walker and Associates in our planning department is a world-class system that we're bringing to you in September. And that's when things get really exciting because we're not only going to bring you the world class system, but probably a couple of different ways you can get there. So, you know, that's what keeps me up at night is the thought that, you know, in the near future, not like the long distance future, but in the near future, we can go out and talk to the public about, you know, some of these world class changes that we want to bring in. And I, uh, I think they'll be well received. Um, I think. You know, the economy and what's happened, uh, you know, at the Fed level and other places, you know, has just taken, you know, 50,000 service hours in the wrong direction over the last 20 years. And I want to get back to where you feel like and people will make the comment of, man, Metro is a bitch in place to, uh, you know, to get great transportation. So uh, I'm hopeful that that's your goal. I know it's going to be a little tough to get there at times. There'll be bumps along the road. And, uh, you know, I'll be quite honest with you. I've filled a couple of auditoriums full of people that are mad about changes. And I just keep reminding the board, it's, they're here because they love the service. They're here because they love what you provide. And uh, this is good times to be able to, to talk about this with the public. Um, but I think there's a much better system out there for Watsonville, a much better system out there for the entire service area. And that's my goal is in September when we bring to you what we feel like is a great world-class system, you get a vision of an excitement on, on trying to get there. Um, had just a couple of things, and then I know we've got a closed session, so I'll, I'll be brief, but we did take delivery of five new battery electric buses. They're your first five battery electric buses. Uh, manufactured by Gilly, and man, they are awesome. I mean, uh, I don't think they've put a governor on them yet, but uh, these things take off like a Ferrari, and they're just beautiful, and they're quiet, and they're everything that Gilly Visual famous for with the battery under the hood. And there are the latest. Uh, the uh, the uh, range on them is significantly better than anything we've seen in the market so far. So. We're excited about them. We've got some bus wraps coming up. We had to either paint them or, or put our bus wrap on them. So we decided to do them in the uh, one ride at a time uh, to basically get these wraps on at that cost neutral to the agency. But I don't know, uh, do, do we have a, a slide on it? No, just keep going. Yeah. Oh, there we go. So these are the five that'll be on the, the Gillick buses. You've got a gorgeous uh, Falcon. Uh, Peregrine Falcon, you've got the uh, Poppy bus that we've wrapped and is sitting in the back, you've got some gorgeous sea otters, um, and you've got a butterfly collection there, and you've got some scenery from uh, from the Monterey Bay. So uh, we're pretty excited. We're going to, these are our first five Gillicks and their world class and battery capability that they have, and they're beautiful. We're going to do a special event and make sure that we get the public involved in uh, you know, inaugurating them into service. So look for some notes from Danielle at some point in the near future. She's trying to pin something down perhaps uh, in September uh, to give folks a chance to come back from their vacations in July and August and be part of just celebrating, a, you know, a really nice milestone. Um, yep. What was the lead time on these? And are they, are they for all the routes? Are they for 17 Express or... 
Some of them are for 17 Express. They just have one door and have the upgraded seating. Uh, it's probably uh, two, uh, I don't know, John, what are, how many of those are Express buses? Four, four, four. four out of the five. So, um, yeah, and I think the lead time, to be totally honest with you, we pulled a lot of strings to get them. And I think uh, I ordered them when I first came on board and so, like, 15 months, 14 months. And you did a RFP or to select Gilly, or how did you select? Uh, John, remind me, how did we go that contract? Yes. Stay, yeah, we went off of somebody's yeah. bid. We piggybacked. provide you more information. Thanks. So uh, uh, in addition, Chuck mentioned 29 buses that are fully funded, ready for you to execute in the fall, uh, the hydrogen buses. And then we have another 10 buses on top of that that I think will bring you at the same time for a total purchase of 39 hydrogen buses. So you'll have one of the biggest hydrogen fleets in the nation. And uh, you know, if there's ever some magic that has been played, Juan de Mu is an expert at uh, reigning in the money. I think it's somewhere around $20 million in vouchers that we brought in to be able to get us to 39 on the hydrogen buses. So he knows how to uh, work Sacramento really well. Um, I will tell you, you know, Chuck talked a little bit about hydrogen pricing, and that is the risk component of the hydrogen technology. It's projected to go down, which is why we felt it was better buy for Metro, but just to give an idea, an idea of how it currently works and why we're comfortable with what we're doing is hydrogen has a, a current price tag, as Chuck mentioned, of about $14 a gallon equivalent. So uh, from there, you get a bunch of rebates that the state provides and you land on what is a per gallon equivalent price of about $9. So just imagine a, a gallon equivalent of diesel uh, being $9, which is pretty pricey. But I think the thing that you, you need to remember uh, is that with hydrogen, you get twice the efficiency. So you will go twice as far on a gallon equivalent of hydrogen than you will on a gallon equivalent of diesel. So in actuality, you're paying for $4.50 for a gallon equivalent of, of your uh, that's the comparable product. So, um, and it's trending downward. And uh, as uh, I mentioned the last uh, month, we uh, we were one of the founding uh, partners in Arches, which is the, uh, it's really an alliance of a bunch of transit agencies and a bunch of other industries that will realize heavy duty hydrogen vehicles. And the whole goal of Arches is to land one of the uh, 10 hydrogen hubs that the federal government is hoping to position within the United States to land one of those in California and significantly drive down the price, as uh, uh, Director Coney had mentioned. Uh, let's get into uh, creating our own hydrogen plant, and that's exactly what transit agencies and others are doing. There'll be over a thousand buses in the alliance. And it looks really good. I mean, if you're ever talking to Senator Laird or your assembly members, uh, this is a good topic to talk about because they'll have a lot to say about this Arches grant and complementing federal money with state money. And it looks like it's on a really good trajectory to get funded. So I, I didn't want to leave today without telling you there's some excitement around the corner uh, with your with buying new buses that don't have tailpipes and they'll be that goal. Um, we mentioned last time about an ad hoc committee that had formed uh, their uh, commentary Johnson had formed an ad hoc and we also complemented it with a working group of some uh, opinion leaders in the community to take a look at our deficit in 27 and take a look at the potential of maybe doing a ballot measure perhaps in November of 24. And so that, uh, that group met and uh, I think the, the going out of the meeting, the common thought was uh, staff get with Senator Laird and see if he can run some legislation that could allow us to be on a ballot, uh, not necessarily answering all the questions that would need to be answered by the board as to whether you, you want to be on a ballot. You, you can't get to second base without going through Laird and the legislature to get to that first base. So with that in mind, uh, Staff has worked uh, with uh, Senator Lair, your legislation that is currently 
has been introduced this week is SB 872, and it was double referred, meaning it's going to go to two committees and in the Senate and two committees in the Assembly. Um, and your first up is uh, on Wednesday uh, with the Senate Governance and Finance Committee. We briefed the staff members in all four of the committees. They like what they see because it's very, it's similar to what they've uh, used in the past and their committees have been amenable to the language. So they don't foresee issues and the language does not uh, in any way uh, take away from the capacity that currently exists for the member agencies with potential sales taxes on their end. So basically all it did, it was create an exemption for Santa Cruz Metro to be on a ballot within the next 10 years, and it does not affect the capacity of the member agencies. So uh, I'll, I'll ship you the, the final language. It literally was being massaged yesterday. It was a few minor tweaks it didn't change any of the intent uh but uh should be out and then i'll send you a, the letter of support that we sent in for that legislation so and i'll keep you posted on it i just wanted to make uh, mention that it, it is moving it will at least give you the opportunity to further explore if and when you'd like to do something on the ballot um uh, and, and with that said it's been said a couple of times um and your staff has been mm -hmm. like Amazing. You have 13 operators in a class that will soon be released into service, and you have an additional 20 coming in right behind them who have been hired, and that will take you uh, to fully staff. And so we're hoping in the fall you have fully staff, and uh, that's an issue that's in the rearview mirror. And there's not a lot of transit agencies in California, let alone the nation, that have done what. You know, Margo and Anna Marie and the trainers have done, and the Don and her HR staff have done. I mean, it just, they have uh, knocked it out of the park. 72 applications at this last go around uh, that they had to work through and ready for that class of 20. So I think that, the, you know, knock on the wood, but to hire this many people, get them trained, get them into revenue service, driving those two buses with all the things going on, the fact that you're not seeing a lot more incidences. Uh, with your buses is a testament that your trainers are working around the clock to make sure nobody gets released, you know, until they're ready to go, until they're confident. So a lot of good things going on at Metro. And so I'm pretty excited to, to be here and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Did you meet some of your new drivers at the barbecue yeah. and Ask. hear their energy and excitement? Uh, and, yeah. Yeah, July 22nd, if you can make it to the rodeo with, uh, with the company picnic, that'd be a great chance. I'll just flag for some of us who've been around for a while, but the last COA we did was all about reduction. And hearing the ridership numbers that Brandon said and the change in service hours over a 20 year span, it seems much of that occurred around 2016. And to be doing another COA and see plans for improvements, whether it's from 60 to 30 or 30 to 15 minute service, I think that's uh, it's going around the bend in a good way. And I think all of us, I mean, you know, I, I hear at Scotts Valley about services, you know, all what we had to do to make ends meet during the, the great reset, you know, almost, you know, I mean, almost bankrupt at that time. And I know in our city, we, we cut tremendously and we're still reeling, we're still hearing, and pandemic hit, we're still hearing about the services that have been cut. And we're having to face the same things. You're saying, there, you know, people are just going, well, why don't we have a parks and rec program? Now, how come these streets aren't fixed? Why is our park not repaired? Um, so we're all struggling to recover and, you know, I appreciate the work that's been done. They're all struggling to get back to the standards that we once had. I forget the, the percentage, our staffing, I believe we're only at 50 some percent of what we had in the 90s. So. Well, I just added, you know, it, it, people understand it was a 30% cut that we took in our budget and we only reduced, I said only, but we only reduced the uh, service by 12 and a half percent. So the district made a really strong attempt to find ways to meet that budget deficit that wasn't take, you know, taking service away. 
but it's just, you know, when you have a 30% cut in your budget, you have no choice but to cut something. It's just the reality of it. Um, here for, um, first question is about the electric buses. So with the, the delivery of these five, is that kind of all the electric buses that we have on order or are there additional five electric buses? That's all you have on right. Okay. Just making sure I just try to keep track of all these zero emission buses that we've been flying around. Um, okay, great. Uh, next question is as far as the Archon's uh, effort grant, um, have we talked to Central Coast Community Energy at all about, I mean, uh, this is the one public entity that it seems to be managing to make money. Uh, and of course, their mission is um, reducing emissions for our region and um, it seems like potentially there could be some alignment of interest there. Um, we had any discussions with them yet about any kind of collaboration on this project? No, I don't think so. I think our collaboration thus far has been they wanted to get a demonstration project set up with Metro on an additional electric bus, and they wanted to do some adaptive charging as opposed to plugging it in. Uh, so that's kind of where their interest has lied so far in the conversations, but that's a great point. I mean, I, uh, I'll reach out to them and make sure they know where we're at with the hydrogen. We did propose to potentially do a project with them and kind of introduce them into the hydrogen space. Um, and uh, I think they were thinking about it, but we didn't quite see any, you know, real strong reaction from them. Um, and then, sorry, one last question. Um, about SB 872, uh, I read it. Yeah, it is. It's a little hard to understand exactly what's going on there. But um, basically, uh, I understood it seemed like it would give this agency up to 1% um, you know, sales tax authority that would not count towards cap. Right. We already have a half cent sales tax. So if this passed, would it actually not just not impact the other jurisdiction, city, county, um, to have sales tax, would it actually free up the capacity of the current half cent sales tax? The current one that's perpetual and that will never go away, that, that we're not going to touch that one. So I understand. Yeah. But does it sort of not count anymore towards the cap? I don't uh, think for the so. Whole county? I don't think or so. Or did it never count? Or? Yeah, I, I'd have to look. I don't think it impacts anything else in the county. I think all it's really doing is giving another half cent sales tax availability for Metro for for a 10 year. I think it sunsets, right? In 10 years. I think it's where it's around the one that's never really going to, you know, ever hear of anymore. It's just it's amazing. Well, well, right. I'm just saying, like, right now, the legislation doesn't exist. So, in theory, the half cent sales tax we already have counts towards each jurisdiction's total, right? So, Example, city of Scotts Valley, I think you're at 9.75, which is our limit. If this passes and says up to 1% of Metro sales tax counted, because it's already a half cent, does that mean that now effectively Scotts Valley is back at 9.35? I, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I think it's go above. It would be that we would go above at that point. Yeah. We could find out for you. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. That'd be nice. That'd be nice if it did. You were talking about world class, which sounds really shiny. It's going to be exciting. But if I'm just a rider and it's trying to ride a bus, I, that, I might not understand that. And with this reimagining outreach that we've all been talking about doing um, within the next few months, I'm wondering how we can use those opportunities to educate folks about what that means. Because, you know, if you're standing next to a hole in the dirt, you're world class. And I mean, there, there's a lot of us like that. And I know that we're trying to improve them. You mentioned what they cost. You mentioned what you're doing in the city to do that. Um, I know there's parts of the unincorporated area that could really use help with that. And I'm wondering if there's ways that we as board members can take some of the World class message with us when we do the outreach because eventually, I think I've mentioned this before. If and when we go to ask for more money, people need to see, oh, yeah, that's that's a no brainer, you know, check, yes. But if they don't receive that because they're, they're waiting all the time or they're standing in the rain, because if you're, if you're on a bus line that has less frequency, you kind of need more shelter. 
you know, if you're standing at a bus stop or it comes up, you're just, you need, you know, you're going to put up with something. But if you're not, then you almost need more shelter. And so I just kind of think of some of these things while we're doing this outreach that tools that we could have to see the conditions that you're talking about um, sort of disseminated to the people that we're going to try to get information from. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited to show you what I think world class news are examples. Yeah, it would be helpful because, like I said, that you're you're doing leadership stuff, and so you, those terms are great. But it it really helps, you know, the writers and 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 you know, historically, if you go back and read old stuff like RTC and Metro stuff, going back to probably even before Mike was on any of these boards, <laughs> the goal was to have. 30% of the population ride transit. And then that number kind of shrunk to about 25. You have goals for us to, to increase ridership. And we have to be able to kind of meet people that aren't getting on the bus right now. <laughs> folks that live where there's no coverage or the frequency isn't there. <clears throat> You know, when you look at the demographics of the county, it's all over the place. I happen to live where all, the, all of us are getting older. And at some point, you know, we don't get to drive or maybe we don't want to drive. And with all these new changes in zoning about how many parking spaces, how much parking coverage, we're going to start losing that. And these are opportunities for us to get these new riders that might not even consider it. Just kind of want to have those tools when we do some of this outreach. Okay. I think we are complete and we'll move into closed session. Um, and we have two items there public employee performance evaluation in conference with labor negotiation. I would like to take a five minute bio break. Oh, excuse me. Public comment on um, CEO oral report. I was ready for that bio break. <laughs> Oh, for the closed session, sorry. Public comments on the two items at closed session, which is A, public employee performance evaluation, and B, conflict with labor negotiation. Okay, seeing none, we'll break for five minutes. Uh, so come back at 11.42, and then we'll go into closed session. <laughs> A report. Thank you. So the board of directors has completed the performance evaluation for the CEO general manager. Before you is a resolution to adopt the first amendment to Mr. Tree's employment agreement. The two items that are changing in the agreement are a 5% increase to the base salary of the CEO, which would bring his total base salary to $267,750 effective April. 25, 2023, which is his anniversary date, and to approve increasing the CEO's monthly car allowance to $800 a month. Thank you. Oh, that was Linda Kegler. And just quickly for public comment, I see there's more people. Oh, is there anyone in the public that would like to comment on this item? I will take a roll call. All right. Uh, Director Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. Uh, Director Dutra has left the meeting. Uh, Director Colin Terry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson has not. Aye. Aye. Is that aye? the phone. All right. And Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Keyrose Carter? Aye. And Director Rockett? He's left. He's left. He left. Okay. All right. And the motion passes. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent work. Um, okay. So our next meeting is Friday, August 25th. Yes. On labor. 
There's no language report. Okay. I just didn't know if we had to say that. No, no report. No reportable act. Okay. Um, all right, now we have our next meeting on Friday, August 25th, and with that, I will adjourn our meeting. Thank you. Have a good July, everybody. Bruce, enjoy the afternoon.